This film is not suitable for children. It contains verbal descriptions of extreme cruelty, including ritualistic abuse, body mutilation, child pornography, and incest. <laughs> Was I abused when I was a kid? If someone had asked me that before I was 37 years old, I would have said no. Mary Knight was a social worker herself, and she's telling her story to try and break the abuse cycle for others. Oh, we have a family of deer that started living here before we did. And Beautiful surroundings. The one thing her life now and her life then have in common. My sister and I would go just exploring through the woods, and that was kind of our getaway. <laughs> Otherwise, this Oregon City filmmaker's early life was something out of a horror film. I had an extremely abusive childhood. I was prostituted as a child. Uh, my parents produced child pornography and used me as um, in it. Mary and I didn't even remember that abuse until she was in her 30s. What was your first reaction to finding out I was doing this project? I thought... Who the heck is she that would do something <laughs> like this? Um, did it make you not trust me? It did. Because I thought, well, what if you were going to, what if you'd already made your decision that what you'd recovered were false memories? So I thought you were a false memory person, and I was very, very careful about you. Just in simple terms, what do you think recovered memory is? Uh, recovered memory is a child undergoes trauma. They're at risk if they tell anyone. So they must find a way to forget it. So they do. And they forget it until the time is safe for them to recall it. Who is Dr. Elizabeth Loftus? Well, she's always introduced by the media as a world-renowned memory researcher. She's a professor. Of psych cognitive psychology. She's also associated with the law department at uh, UC Irvine. These claims about repression um, are claims that, uh, you know, horrible brutalization is banished into the unconscious by some process that's beyond ordinary forgetting and remembering. And then, you know, years later, you according to the theory, go through some kind of therapy that uh, lifts this veil of repression and makes you aware of the experiences. And it, it's that kind of claim that I just haven't seen any real credible scientific support for. Uh -huh. It's a kind of a strange experience for me because, you know, often it the individuals who, who think they were abused or think they have repressed memories of abuse, um, they don't particularly want to talk to me uh -huh. and, and I, they don't want to have their memories questioned and they are typically you know angry at people this is a new experience uh, yeah for both of us for, yeah. yeah for yeah. yeah for both of us if I'm willing to do a documentary entitled am I crazy my journey to determine if my memories are true then one thing I have to do is truly question my memories I have to commit to myself I'm gonna question it and to me, the best way to do it is to talk to people who don't believe memories like mine exist. I don't know anything about your situation. I, I'm a survivor of extreme abuse, of ritualistic abuse. Ritualistic child abuse may include desecration of something sacred, group settings, torture. Ritualistic abusers sometimes hide their crimes within cults, churches, child pornography networks, and other organizations. I was molested by a number of um, family member and non-family members. 
and you know, I, I told you I made make cookies for you with my mom's recipe, but um, she she sexually abused me. Your mother. So how old w were you? Um, it was through a long period of my childhood. But like what to what? I mean, starting what age? Young to um, through teenage years. Yeah, so it was for a long time, yeah. And then what happened? Um, then I, uh, my, um, I had relatives who remembered and I went to counseling and um, I remembered. So then how old were you, but roughly then? About 37. Hmm. Yeah. And how do you know it really happened? The real reason I know is that I just have a really spiritual connection and I, that's just what I know to be true in my deepest self. But then also I do have five relatives with similar memories. Right. I had hoped they would be interviewed for the documentary. It looks like none of them will be, but I'm still hopeful about one. But um, really, in a way, it's okay that they don't because most survivors don't have that kind of external corroboration. And I've, I want this documentary to say to survivors, you're okay. And you don't need something external because, I mean, that's really part of the abuse was that your thoughts and your feelings and your perceptions are not enough. And so then if in therapy or in recovery we say, well, you need external corroboration, what does that, what message is that? My cousin Lisa. If you say something you don't want to use, that's... I'm just so glad you're willing to do it at all. And really, the first thing, I mean, the answer to this question, um, I mean, basically, you're, you're my cousin. Yes, we're cousins. <laughs> so I'm wondering if we have memories in common. And I was, I was raped by our grandfather. Do you have a memory like that? Yes. Yes, I do. I believe uh, we came from a family that engaged in generational abuse and um, that I was abused by multiple family members. My father, do you think he was, my father abused me, my father abused me by being, uh, allowed me to abuse, be abused by other people? Yes. Did that happen yes. to you? Yes. I mean, he was, he was not someone who physically touched me, but almost coaching others, somehow taking pictures as well. So this would be child pornography? I have no idea what he was doing with what he was taking, but um, yes, yes. Encouraging others to be involved in sexual acts with me and filming them, so yeah. Okay, that definitely happened to me. Lisa allowed me to use her exact words, but her voice was replaced by that of an actor. So now I, I basically, I have five minutes of your story and yeah. your, well, I, I don't, I, I hope this won't be offensive, but your, your claims about what other people said, but I haven't heard those claims from them. And so I don't know, so I can't be sure if, if when you tell me and, you know, and I have an aunt and she says she was abused or, you know, did the aunt really say that? And did the aunt really mean that? And, or did the aunt really mean something else like emotional abuse rather than sexual or ritual abuse? Um, mm -hmm. So without having so little data, it's really hard for me to mm -hmm. know what to, to think. But if they did say that, I mean, I, I know that they did. Yeah. You know, I mean, you don't know it, I understand that, but I know that they did. So you're asking, like, why do I believe it? Well, that's one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. And so then after I would remember something, I'd call one of them, and they'd, you know, have a similar memory to a lot of my memories. Your investigation about your memories was all on camera, and you did not know how it was going to turn out. Yeah. You know... I think that's why I did it. I really now think 
that I did it because I knew I needed to challenge myself that much. And now I realize I did this project as my way to confront my parents who are deceased. It was my way to sit across from my parents and say, why, why did you do what you did? And why aren't you now treating me good? I traveled to Florida to interview Eleanor Goldstein, the author of three books, Disputing Recovered Memories. My husband, Jerry, came with me as my camera person. Eleanor is about the same age my mother would have been. She invited us to stay with her and I thought about doing it. Instead, we went to the hotel and figured out how to use sound equipment. So why don't you tell me how beautiful I am or something so I can see how the cameraman sounds in it. Don't push your luck. Okay, that's a wonderful response. Confabulation is a mixture of fact and fantasy to create a new memory. Mm -hmm. We do that every day. We, mm -hmm. we mix our memories up with other people's memories. Mm -hmm. So we've learned that memory is very, very uh, pliable. And you can get people to believe anything that you want them to believe if you use the right techniques. Mm -hmm. How did you get your memories back? Did you get it back spontaneously? Did you get it back with the aid of a therapist who used some suggestibility? That was my greatest fear in going was, oh, I was like, they'll ask me some question that I'd never thought of before. And then I'll go, maybe my memories aren't true. I'm, the questions they asked, I'd already asked myself. I was an investigator when I remembered my views. I'd been, um, I had been, well, I'd done, at that point, two or 300 custody evaluations. I placed 100 kids in adoptive homes. And you always, you, of course, you investigate those homes very carefully. And I know how to do investigations. And so then, when I remembered my, my own abuse, I treated it like, I mean, I could let myself just go, if I were the investigator on this case, what questions would I ask? And I asked myself all those questions. I was seeing a counselor and I did have, I had five hypnosis sessions. I have, I don't have those with me, but I have, uh, well, actually I have the- Then how do you know for sure that these memories are true if you have five hypnosis sessions? I asked for hypnotherapy and okay. I asked for it because I had young kids and I had reasons to suspect relatives. And I needed to know. I needed to know who, I, who to protect my kids from. Oh, sure. I transcribed the hypnosis tapes, but listening to those and transcribing them, that was an excellent psychologist. <laughs> she did not ask any leading questions. I think that survivors, and I tried to do this, like I didn't, I wouldn't go on antidepressants for a long time because it's like, oh, my parents are more likely to believe my memories are true and then they'll go get treatment if I don't, you know, do anything wrong. No. That's not why they don't believe you. No, it's not why. Like, why do you believe me? Because I know you. When did you start believing me? Several months after I met you. And what made the difference? I didn't disbelieve you in the beginning. I just had to get to know you better. What made the difference with believing me? Nothing in particular. I just got to know you. Bullshit memories that come back like that out of the blue. I, would, I spoke in Canada at, at um, Simon Fraser University, dentist. And all of a sudden, 20 years later, some patient comes and says, I remember 20 years ago you abused me when I was in the dental chair, but I forgot about it until I went to therapy. Now I remember. I was wondering why you interviewed her. She's, I know she's written a couple of books that I've read. She's written three books. She's written three books, but she's not a memory expert. No, she's, she's not. not. You know, she's not a mental health expert. But I interviewed her because I was told that there was someone who had firsthand information that Marilyn's memories were not true. And now, Miss America of 1958. From Atlantic City, New Jersey. It would not be possible to know or understand me unless you knew about the unending sexual violations I endured as a child and as a teenager. The trauma was so severe, I did what many children do in order to survive. I split 
or to use the psychiatric word, I dissociated. I split into what I call a day child and a night child. As difficult as this is for most people to believe or understand, until I was 24, I, the day child, had no conscious knowledge of the night child. All I'm saying is I knew this very beautiful, intact, happy, go And how well did woman. you know her? Well, not very well, except that I was in a class with her every single day. But I had been told that she had first-hand information that Marilyn's memories weren't true. And so I had questions like, um, I had questions for like, well, tell me about the time she confided in you. They took a class together in college. She has no other information about her. Did she tell you that Marilyn's memories were false? Or was that? Yeah. Oh, she did. Well, she told me that they were very, you know, that. Questionable? Questionable. She will allow me to use some footage. What footage? Of Marilyn? Uh, from a talk she gave. Mm hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I don't because know. Because she doesn't want to be confronted. She has a, a, she has a prepared speech, and uh -huh. that's what she's willing to acknowledge, but she doesn't want to be confronted, apparently. Oh, I really get to talk to her. I'm nervous and excited. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Marilyn. It's Mary Knight. It's nice to hear your voice. It's good to hear your voice. I am, oh, I just, I just have so much respect for you. I remembered in my abuse in 93, and it was in, uh, like a year later, my counselor gave me this video of a presentation you did. And so I took it home, I was sitting in my living room listening to your presentation, and of course when you say, you know, if you're comfortable, if you're a survivor and you're comfortable standing, you may do so now. I stood up in my living room. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, someday I want to do what Marilyn's doing for incest survivors, I want to do for survivors of ritual abuse. So, and that's what you're doing. It is. I asked survivors to stand for several reasons. One is because I'm always hoping there are some of you here today who are as empowered as I finally am. It took me 53 years to get rid of shame, but I don't have an ounce of shame today. I'm so very proud of who I am. And I hope that there are others of you here today who have also worked through the shame. Do you think survivors need to go public in order to heal from the shame? Oh, I do not. No, so, I think each of us is on a different journey. Um, some people are, will stand publicly without shame. As long as survivors work through the shame, if the reason they don't stand is because of shame, then that's a problem for me. Did you know Eleanor Goldstein in college? I did not know Eleanor Goldstein in college. I wanted to go back to school. I wanted to go back to college. And people would say to me, do you really think you can go back and just be a junior in college? That wasn't the problem. The problem was how people reacted to me. I went to the football game and people were lining up for my autograph. The Miss America pageant Atlantic City, New Jersey, let's join Miss Colorado, Marilyn Van Derber at the Hammond organ. At that time, Miss America was very, very highly regarded. I am old, so I can remember when the Miss America pageant was the most popular TV show. That was you are old. Yeah, yeah, that was before the Super Bowl. What about um, the former Miss America, Marilyn Vandebeer? She went through a tremendous amount of all kinds of different therapy before, highly suggestive therapy before she told the story of abuse. So how, that's not what it was reported in People magazine. Did, is there some other way you have yeah, oh, I've, I've watched lectures that she's given. And, and in lectures she said what? She's talked about the massive amount of therapy. But that was not, that was after remembering. I'm not sure of that, no. Mm what she, yeah, she has said publicly that she remembered, I mean, it's, 
Well, I have the People magazine here. Yeah, article. but I, I've read a whole bunch more than just People magazine about that case. It's a, it's, it's a very suspicious case. And tell me more why you said I just, that? I just believe that uh, she had lots and lots of, uh, of different kinds of therapy, and so we can't know whether what, what she ultimately came up with is an actual memory or is a, is a product of suggestive therapy. We just don't know. How old were you when you first had therapy? Uh, my memories came up when I was 24. I did not start therapy until I was 39. You think she's not telling the truth? I, I don't. I, I don't know, but I've heard about a whole bunch of other therapy and afterwards. No, I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure of that. So you think? So your concern is what therapy she had before 1960? I, I, I just don't know that those memories are real. Uh huh. And then her sister, of course always remembered sexual abuse. Well, we don't know father. exactly what her sister remembered, though. I've never read exactly, you know, what the sister remembered. The sister su supposedly um, felt there was some kind of abuse, but I don't know what it sexual is. Sexual abuse. That the sister was remembering, so I just don't know. So that could be a corroborated case if the sister has continuous memory of the memory that Marilyn has. Well, I don't know that, yeah, well, we'd have to know a whole lot more. Uh -huh. And I just, I only, I only get to know in depth about the cases that I work on. And, and uh -huh. the, you know, the rest of them, it's kind of newspaper knowledge. So I had a press conference, and the next day it was on the page, front page of the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post. I got a phone call. <clears throat> They're calling your sisters. I called my sister Gwen in San Francisco, and I said, if you want to go public with this, do it in California because we're never gonna get off the front pages in Denver. The next morning, the third day, it was on the front page of the paper again with my sister's story and my picture. I waited until our daughter awakened. She had just come home from her sophomore year in college. She woke up and I said to Larry and Jennifer, I have to get out of here, I have to go. So we put on our sweats and we went to the high school track. We were jogging around the track and the woman with her two dogs came. We always said hello, she stopped me. And she said, Marilyn, we're so proud of what you're doing. And I'm so grateful your sister came forward this morning. I had been upset about that. And I said, really, why? And she said, because yesterday, on our most popular radio talk show, people were calling in and saying, why should we believe her? Now that your sister has come forward, they will have to believe you. I was stunned. I looked at her and I said, if people are not going to believe 53-year-old me, then who is going to believe a child? Why didn't you tell anyone about the abuse? I, I mean, I get asked, like, well, why didn't you tell someone when you were a child? I know, I did tell someone when I was about six. Who did you tell? Who, who was it? I don't remember, but the story got back to one of my two parents, and they realized that they would have to do something to silence me. Dad made me, he, he made me do something. He made me eat something that I thought was poisonous, and I thought he would, I thought he was killing me. I thought my father was killing me. And your father's a physician, right? Yeah, he so is. So he would know whether or not that would kill you? Yeah, he would. But at age six? I didn't know. You thought it was going to kill you? I did. And I was awfully surprised to wake up in the morning because I thought I was going to die, but I woke up. But I was unsure that I thought I might die the next day. It took me a couple of days before I realized that I was going to live. Yeah. And it did silence you, and was that when you started, was, what, was that when you started hiding those, that knowledge of it from yourself? Yeah, that is because I could never talk about it again. I could never yeah. think about it. So anytime I thought about it, I would have to push it away. I mm -hmm. would just say, forget it. Mm -hmm. Have you read this book? No, I haven't. I recommend it. Okay. It's good. It talks about the connection between mind and body. Okay. And yeah, I've I, heard good things about it. Yeah, yeah, I'd heard things about it, and then I read it, 
And I thought, this is who I want to interview. And then I found out he was doing a conference in Portland. What does it mean, the body keeps score? We are our bodies. Our head is only one-seventh of our whole organism, and our frontal lobe, where we have any thoughts, is only one quarter of that. The function of the brain is to take care of the body. And so, when you get traumatized, everything in your survival brain, which is like about half of your brain, gets set to be worried about survival. And that's all expressed in bodily sensations. And then the next part of your brain is involved in creating a map of the world. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as your brain forms, you don't know anything about what's going out there, and that part of the brain, which you call the limbic system, you can call it any number of things, um, it creates a map of what's going on out there and how I do react to. And it tells you what is safe, what's dangerous, who am I in relationship to my surroundings, where do I go to get the good stuff, what do I avoid to get the bad stuff, and so that is a hardwired map of your brain. Your early experiences determine that map of your brain. So if people beat you up and tell you that you're a rotten kid, the, that map of the world is, I'm a rotten person, I'm a terrible person, and the world is an unsafe place. Extremely difficult to change. These are hardwired parts of the brain. And our job, of my profession, is to find out how we can rewire these very primitive maps. And so at the very core of trauma is the whole notion that our brain scan showed it is the uh, the verbal language center of the brain gets knocked out when people become extremely upset. From the very first moment I started to see traumatized people, the issue of people not remembering or just seeing images, just having feelings, was very prominent. I, I wrote about it the moment I started to write about Vietnam veterans, that these memories were really very different from the memories of the movie you saw yesterday. Um, and that's what's really fascinating, is that um, the language center of the brain shuts down, all that memory stuff becomes complicated, and, um, and that memory of trauma is different. And what became very clear is that if you're not allowed to talk about the trauma, or you're not allowed to help, for people to help to make sense out of being dumbfounded, or as Shakespeare says, struck with speechless terror, then the memory sort of goes away, but your body keeps reacting because your body knows in some ways. Mm -hmm. And that is really the very first thing that got me interested in trauma is that I wrote a whole bunch of case histories of people who were in the coconut club fire in 1943 who couldn't remember what happened, but on the anniversary of the fire, they would run out in the street and scream fire, fire, and try to hurt people together. And Vietnam veterans would reenact that trauma, but wouldn't remember what happened. There were a few things that I have always remembered yeah. that I think were not right. I remember my dad saying that he was sexually attracted to me. Uh, I think well, that's... How old were you when he said that? You know, I don't think it matters how old someone is. It's no, just wrong. I mean, you can say, oh, yeah. You know, some things you just take as a, as a joke. People say stupid things. That's not something I think a father would usually joke about, that he's sexually attracted to his daughter. What did you say? How old were you? You don't remember? Yeah, I do. I remember I was about 13. You sent that email and said, this is Eleanor's daughter, a survivor. Uh, and she's a survivor. I'm yeah. like, wow. I think it's pretty courageous of her after so many years oh, I to go know. public. Oh. So you're sure you're a survivor of abuse? Oh, yeah. As sure as I can be without having, you know, footage of it. Yes. And I have to trust that. Otherwise, where does it leave me? Do you remember actually telling your parents about it? Yeah, because I didn't know they had anything to do with it. Uh -huh. The first memory that came up, I just remembered babysitters. How did your interest in the subject begin? So I was doing all this research, and my uh, function was to find out information. And I was sitting at my desk one day, and there was an article, and it said, parents claim to be falsely accused. So that was a lie. But absolutely, the deeper truth is that she had a daughter, who me, who was having memories. We have to help each other. 
and forgive and understand and have empathy and not carry grudges forever and ever, generational, one generation after the other, hates, 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 he touched me. Oh my God, he touched me. And therefore he touched me and he's dead. He's dead. And so even if again. there was the incestuous touch, you think the family should I don't still know stay what together. incestuous the touch is. I well, mean, it requires if somebody you know. comes into your bedroom and forces himself on you, that's one thing. If he, if he, what if, what if what? I had an uncle, my sister says, used to uh, fondle her. Yeah, he'd hold a newspaper like this and he'd fondle her. Okay, he's dead. Don't ever speak to him again, he's dead. He made a terrible mistake. So even fondling, you think, Say, get out of here, Uncle Irving, leave me alone, and walk so away. So you think the little kid should be responsible for defense? I think at a certain point, if he's uncomfortable, he should speak up for themselves and be responsible for themselves, not carry a grudge from century to century. But if there was sexual touch, do you think the family should still stay together? Of course. Even if there was Absolutely, touch. yes. I don't think that, I don't think sexual touch is the horror of all horrors. I don't think so. I think we make a big to-do about nothing. How did the child sexual abuse affect you? I don't know. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't pin anything on it. You don't know of any way it affected you? I don't, nope. At age six, she was fondled. I read you told you were afraid you were pregnant. That's just because I didn't know. I didn't, uh -huh. I didn't, I was like naive and, Oh, did you not know how sex... No, I didn't, know. Oh, so you... So I just thought maybe, you know, he left some sperm somewhere, and, or, you know, or whatever, and maybe then, when you turn 13, that's when it kicks in and makes uh, you pregnant. Oh. Yeah, she testified for my father in the lawsuit in which I sued my parents and won. Daughter wins sex abuse case against parents. The judge believed me. And the case was corroborated. Well, I had a sister who always remembered, and I had a father who said, it's not sexual abuse if a father makes his daughter touch his penis. Well, actually it is, it's a crime. Yeah, and he, he said that in a deposition. Yeah, right? he did. In the case, Lynn Crook, the part that McNally includes is that she testified that her father said, keep your legs together, but, the full quote is, keep your legs together or I'll think you want me, which is, I consider, extremely inappropriate. But he only quoted that first part of it, making it seem like there was no evidence. But, you know, if a father really does say that to a daughter, to me that is evidence that he is not appropriate sexually. Well, I don't know whether it means he did anything, but as far as the accusations of Lynn Crook, I think they're extremely dubious. How do you feel about Dr. Loftus? Oh, I think that, um, I think she designed a defense for people who were facing civil charges. They needed a defense back in 1991. She discovered one. She created it for them, she created the research to back it up, and that's where she is, and she gets paid a ton of money to do it. And no one fact checks anything she says. Yeah, yeah. And she's very, very good with the media. Do you ever get mad at her? Oh, I think I used to, especially after she falsified my case to the media. Yeah. Yeah, that, that shocked yeah. me. After you take your case to court and you Talk, say all this personal stuff about yourself. You win the case and someone lies about your case to the media. I mean, that's just, it's just dumb. Yeah. Really, she thought she could do that to me. Yeah. And so I, that's why I filed the ethics complaint. Really, you can't do that. Dr. Loftus resigned from the American Psychological Association one month after Lynn Crook filed an ethics complaint against her. I mean, you can't. You can't yeah, do that. you can't lie. You can't lie. Yeah. You tell about a study you did of 105 women in drug treatment that about 50 percent were sexually abused. Um, that was a study of women who were in outpatients treatment for substance abuse, and it was being done by a psychiatrist. So I talked her into putting some memory questions into her survey mm -hmm. with these women. We asked them to tell us, you know, the status of their memory. Would would they? Which of these statements is closest to you? 
I always remembered, even if I didn't talk about it, uh, I remembered parts of the abuse, but maybe not all of it. Uh, I forgot for a period of time, and then, then the memory came back. And there were like 9% who It was forgot. something like eight, 17 or 18 percent, depending on whether oh, you uh -huh. count missing data or not, oh, uh -huh. who said, I forgot for a period of time, and then the memory came back. Um, but we don't know what, you know, in the end, we don't know what they meant by that. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of genuine abuse right. and abuse by right. priests and people who yeah. don't think about it for a long time and then they'd get reminded of it. And so What about Ross Chait? Do you know about, I mean, he says that he... Um, I don't know that he would say he repressed his memory. Yes. Dr. Ross Chait lists 110 corroborated recovered memory cases on his website. His own case is number 26. I mean, because he does, he seems to have found corroboration, okay. some corroboration, okay. but, it do, but we don't know that he repressed it. Dr. Ross Chait is an attorney, author, and Brown University professor. He calls his website Recovered Memory Archives. I think in general, people who are abused as children either heal from it or they use that, ex or that experience propels them to hurt other people. And with Dr. Loftus, what I think the most reasonable explanation for an intelligent woman ignoring not only the neuroscientific research that's out now, but her own survey study that showed that 18% um, of people, of child sexual abuse survivors ha in the study had delayed recall. The explanation I can find is she was affected by her own childhood hurt. And unlike my parents, she doesn't hurt children, but she has made life hell for a lot of survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. Dr. Loftus has testified on behalf of hundreds of accused parents. She was hired as a consultant by Bill Cosby's defense team. Dr. Loftus testified for Ghislaine Maxwell, Harvey Weinstein, Michael Jackson, Ted Bundy. I'm not interested in Dr. Loftus and her research. I'm a trauma specialist. She's a laboratory specialist who looked, shows people's movies about what they just saw that has no emotional valence. She doesn't inform the work of child abuse, priest abuse, and childhood trauma, because that's not her area of expertise. So. As a scientist, the only people whose work is interesting to me are people who can clarify how people process the memory of extreme experiences. And she happens to be not one of them. So you cannot study people being raped in a laboratory because we cannot rape people in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're really talking about apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. and it's boring to talk about orange growth. But other people talk about apples. A whole group of people studied the British Army after the evacuation of Dunkirk in 1940, and they find one, that one third of the people block out their memories and are in a daze, and they write it up in medical journals. And that is like, everybody knows that. And then when incest survivors say, this happened to me too, people say, no, it happens to soldiers, but it doesn't happen to you. Do you think that the people just don't want to look at something that bad as incest? Oh, no, it's, it's not that. It's that certain people don't want to look at that. The army didn't want to look at the memory loss in the First World War. And so in 1917, on July, June 16th, the British general staff says, you're not allowed to use the word shell shock anymore because it will undermine the morale of the war and people will no longer want to fight. So if it's not politically convenient, people are not allowed to talk about it. And so it's fine for incest victims to talk about the trauma, as long as I'm not the perpetrator of the incest. In 1991, People Magazine did three cover stories on recovered memory. By then, you had 24 states had allowed victims to sue on, based on recovered memories. It was, there were, there were thou, probably thousands of people in, in the U.S. who were concerned about a defense for these lawsuits. And so Loftus was out there tossing out ideas to the media. Was this, 
were these uh, sexual fantasies. Uh, daughters were dreaming about fantasizing about their husbands. Their about, fathers. About their fathers, <laughs> about their fathers. What were all these, um, what were all these things about? Certainly they couldn't be about sexual abuse. So finally she came up with a story well, it must be a therapist implanting, suggesting ideas to their clients. And that became the defense. It first made a headline in August 1991 in the Washington Post. That became their defense. Before then, they had nothing. No, they not people who ha have a real serious stake in the science of what's going on here. They're an advocacy group mm -hmm. for people who, for reasons of their own, Mm -hmm. You figure out what it is. Need to deny that incest is real. They have a problem. I was a speaker at the Virtual Global Summit to End Sexual Exploitation. That's how I met fellow speaker and fellow child abuse survivor, Crystal Denise Garcia. Crystal, it's great to see you. You are such a good pandemic friend. Oh, yes, I love our friendship and I can't wait to meet up someday. Me too. Something you and I have in common is recovered memories of child abuse. Please tell about yours. Yeah, so the first recovered memory I had was when I was pregnant. I got my recovered memory from of child abuse, and I never knew that I, I had been abused. I, I had parts of my life that were blacked out, but I thought it was just maybe I was too young to remember it. I realized that it was blacked out because of trauma. And so when I was pregnant, that recovered memory came back. I had no clue that, that I had suffered that. And when I told the, the nurse, she said, oh yeah, that's normal. That happens to pregnant women all the time. I recently uncovered another, an, another memory and it was from even earlier uh, in, in my, in my childhood. And that was very intense. It was very intense. I, I could barely get through it. And so I went seeking support. I went to a therapist and I told her what happened. I told her what I was dealing with. I told her what I was trying to work through. That was very, very difficult for me. And she said, okay, well, maybe that happened, but who can verify that for you? And I was just really blown away because I was like, what do you mean? Maybe it happened. I just told you it happened. And why are you seeking verification outside of me when I'm here in front of you telling you why is someone else's voice more valid than mine? So I felt shut down. I felt degraded. And who would I verify that with? Who would I verify my personal experiences that I survived with? And I, I, it's not like I would have anyone to ask for verification. And I mean, it's, I was in such dangerous situations as a child, but I ended up in foster care. I'm so sorry that happened to you. There's actually an organization that recommends counselors do just what your counselor did. That's, that's horrifying. I don't even understand why an organization like that would, would exist. It's called the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Wow. Just the name alone is is pretty cringy. I mean, that's pretty disturbing. I mean, it's that sounds like just complete gaslighting, you know, just shutting survivors down. That's disturbing. it's made up of it's made up of parents, accused parents, people whose oh own children consider them rapists. Wow. And nobody has a problem with this. They don't realize that the people who are being like, who who are being said that they are predators are now running an organization to say that they're not. <laughs> that's, that's a good that's point. That's really alarming. It was started by the parents of Dr. Jennifer Fry just a year after she recovered memories of incest by her father. Dr. Jennifer Fry is a researcher, professor, author, and expert on the psychology of sexual trauma. She wrote a book on betrayal trauma theory stating that if children are sexually abused by a caregiver, they might forget the abuse in order to maintain the relationship with the person they depend on for survival. It makes sense. 
Humans have a very well-developed attachment system. The attachment system works in both the dependent person and in the caregiver. We've got a, a reciprocal relationship in the sense that both the caregiver and the um, infant are giving each other reinforcement for this relationship. And the infant has to do that because this is an extremely resource expensive relationship for the caregiver. So imagine that baby detecting some mistreatment and trying to respond in the way an empowered person would. That baby's probably risking his or her life because the caregiver might withdraw. The first interview for this film was in Philadelphia. It was with Dr. Jennifer Fried's mother, Pam Fried. I was so nervous. Meeting the founder of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation was my first step in an on-camera confrontation with the deepest and most vulnerable part of myself. Hi. Hi. Something's gotten you questioning, and you really are. Yeah. Been very I really. Uh, yeah. Carefully. Yeah. I think and I admirable. appreciate. Oh, thank you. I just was really surprised. I pick up the phone and call and. I didn't expect to actually, you answer your phone and then I'm like, can I come? And you're like, that's okay. And I mean, it's the name I've always associated with, you know, False Memory Syndrome Foundation. Um, you and your husband are founders, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I decided to do this, the film, Am I Crazy? Um, I decided to really, truly, honestly explore, could my memories not be true? And as you know, I mean, I've had them, it was, it's been 20 or 21 years that, since I remembered. So, uh, but I wanted to talk to the best people about it. And I, I thought, yeah, that's you and then whoever you recommend. I have another question. Yes. Your aunt. Was it yes. your, your uh, aunt? My father's sister. Did say some things that sowed some really serious doubts and great concerns. Yes. And you wanted to be sure your children were safe. Oh, absolutely. Right. I didn't want to break contact unnecessarily, but I didn't want my children to be at risk. Your aunt seems to have been influential in your life. She seems to have played a really strong role in your beliefs. No, I mean, I just didn't know her. I just hadn't been around her for, you know, some time. My father's sister hadn't wanted to see him for years. And I didn't know why. And she lived not far from where I lived. And I mean, I lived in the Dallas, Texas area. And so my parents came to see me and they saw my aunt on that same visit. And I said, well, what did she say? You know, because I mean, she hadn't talked to you for years. What's going on? They told me that she thought she was abused. And I said, well, what are you going to do? You know, she, well, we just won't see her anymore. And I said, well, you mean you're just never going to see her again? Oh, yeah, she's, she's crazy. We won't see her anymore. They both said that. And then I called my aunt, and I said, would you meet with me? And she said, yes, I will. I had the sense it was true, and I, I didn't have any memories, but I went to a counselor at that point. So what happened after you? You recovered these memories and... Well, my first memory was just, it didn't come under hypnosis. It was a flashback as I was, um, my counselor had me write down what I do remember, what, anything I do remember from my childhood, just anything, no matter how benign. And during that period of time, I remembered I had this flash. I had a flash of a man grabbing a dog gruffly. And so then I had my first hypnosis. And under hypnosis, um, she wanted to go up the sleeve to um, see who the man was. And that tape is still gut-wrenching for me to hear because it's just like, I just was sobbing because it was my dad. I called my dad at that point. I called him at work because I thought if I talked to him directly, he would get into counseling too. And then we could both determine what was going on here. And um, I could still have a relationship with my parents. 
So I called him and he said, I have a very good memory and I know that didn't happen. And um, he said, I, I suppose we won't have any contact with you anymore. I said, well, I, I never said that. I, it's not my intent of the phone call. I did tell him my children wouldn't be visiting that summer. Um, but I never said that I wouldn't have contact with him. And he, uh, he said, is this gonna lead you to believe that you were sexually abused by me? I said, well, I, I don't think so. You know, I mean, I, so anyway, that, that, um, that was the change in my relationship with my parents. And this was all in Texas? I lived in Texas and they lived in Denver. What was the year? I think it was 1992. Tell about when did your organization start? And we started in 1992. There were a bunch of families that got together. We were one of them because um, uh, our daughter recovered memories and um, that was how the foundation started. We were trying to figure out uh, what was going on and we found other families and we found some professionals. And now Dr. On Underwager, Underwager, whatever. Um, was, who, was he one of the professionals that helped with it? He was one of the first people we called. He helped, um, you know, he had taken a phone number so that people could call to request information. Um, this was before the foundation was actually formed. So did he give you some phone numbers he had or something? Well, he had been doing that all along. And he said he would speak with families. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes, we had contact with him. When we first formed the foundation, we thought he might be uh, good to be on the advisory board. We had no idea whatsoever about um, the interview he'd had in the Netherlands. Hydeka describes itself as a pro-pedophile publication. In a 1991 interview, Dr. Underwager was asked, is choosing pedophilia a responsible choice? He replied, certainly it is responsible. Pedophiles can boldly and courageously affirm what they choose. They can say, I believe this is in fact part of God's will. That really has nothing to do with recovered memories, that has to do with some opinions on... On pedophilia. On child abuse, uh, yeah, pedophilia. On pedophilia. And whether it's child abuse. But was, isn't Dr. Wakefield still on your board? Or she was quoted in She's still too. on the board. Well, she, she, was, she was in the interview too. They wrote papers together, they wrote a book together, and she's asked, doesn't your book, Accusations of Child Sexual Abuse, suggest that all sexual relationships between adults and children in the United States are abusive relationships? And she says, no. She said something like, there should, that the only way we could know if pedophilia was harmful is to do research with, um, you know, with children, like nine, was, 10, 11 year old children, she was, uh, and seeing how, how a long-term loving relationship, sexual relationship between them and an adult would affect them, if I understood that, right? Did I understand that wrong? I would have to go and check the years that she's talking about, but she was uh, talking about another country. Wakefield said, it would be nice if someone could get some kind of big research grant to do a longitudinal study of, let's say, a hundred 12-year-old boys in relationships with loving pedophiles. This is impossible in the United States right now. But in terms of the issue of, you know, if somebody's memories are true, that's not, that's not a helpful thing. Since you had hypnosis, I would like to give you two or three oh, I'd be glad general to. articles and then you can read them yeah. and you can make your own decisions yeah. in terms yeah. of but, uh, yeah. what you think about the reliability. Most but I of my memories were not under hypnosis. At some point, if physical evidence is lacking, if there is no physical evidence for something, at some point, 
many people want to just step back and say, whoa, I think I need to rethink this. I think your idea of doing a transcript of my uh, hypnosis tapes is great. That's the most objective. I hadn't really thought about that. Well, I'm happy to speak to anybody who is really searching to find out Oh, that's so good. What happened? I have another question. Yes. If I were to send you or to give you some materials, would you be willing to read them? Yeah, I'd be glad to read them. And you're open to reading skeptical oh, things. Oh, I'll read. Because, and, I absolutely. You know, and I, I've read a lot, actually. Yeah, and I'll read more. Yeah, I'll read whatever you um, recommend I read. Well, thank you for making the trip. Thank you for being open to questioning. Pam Fry suggested I interview FMSF board member, Dr. Lauren Pancraft. I lived in Portland at the time, which is where he lives. All I'm suggesting is, maybe your memories are correct, maybe your memories are wrong. But if they're wrong, it will take you a while to undo them, to mm -hmm. begin to unravel mm -hmm. them and to say, mm -hmm. oh, maybe they weren't quite right. Maybe mm -hmm. these were memories that are actually not true. There were things that happened to me in my mind more than that happened to me in my body. Mm -hmm. So all I'm asking is, you know, keep that idea open. Yeah. I ha and. One thing I did was the whole month of December, I read only literature that was um, with the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. I could see that I was getting less defensive. And but, that's why you're making yeah. this movie. Yeah. <laughs> right. but, but one thing when I was reading that, I wanted to ask you, some of that, some of the, what I was reading, one thing was saying like a young child who's under age two or under age three um, will never remember any abuse and if they are abused, won't be affected by it. Is that what you think? A child under two really doesn't have memories of anything that happened. Anything that, doesn't, that isn't painful, the child, it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt the child. I mean, it may be morally wrong to touch a child who's under two. It may be obnoxious, it may be, it, that's a terrible thing to do, and society says no. But if you think about it, it doesn't, it doesn't damage the child. It's, it's wrong, but the child is not damaged by it unless it's physically hurt. Physically injured or physically hurt? Physically injured or hurt, well, unless what the if, child cries. If the child cries, then would that affect the child later? So far as we know, uh, children who have been, who been physically abused, any way abused, they don't remember that. And it doesn't seem to have any later effect on them. So that's kind of good news for my sons wanting to find babysitters for their kids because their kids are oldest is two. And so even if their kids are beat up a little bit at the babysitter, it's not going to affect them um, and unless there's an injury. And moreover, we know that most abuse of children under two, the most real sexual abuse that occurs, has to do with touching, usually not penetration. It's usually not very violent. It's not violent at all. It's usually more curiosity, exploration. You think a reason someone would fondle a one-year-old is curiosity? I think that's usually what people think. So someone who would want to touch a one-year-old's vagina, does that for curiosity? Well, that would be one motivation. And what would they be curious about? What would an adult be curious about, about a one year I, I don't get it. That's, that's why it's deviant. Yeah, but and you think it wouldn't uncommon. hurt them? Uh, stroking the vagina of a two-year-old child, uh, 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 an unrelated male stroking a child for curiosity for any other reason. For sexual reasons for sexual and having reasons. an orgasm when the child's there would not affect the child. 
that child wouldn't remember that. For example, if the child saw, if a two-year-old child saw their parents murdered, they wouldn't remember that. That would be a terrible thing to observe for a two-year-old child, but they wouldn't remember it and therefore wouldn't be affected by it. Most mental health professionals do not agree with Dr. Pancras. I went to a child abuse conference in Salt Lake City. That's where I met Dr. Susie Wyatt, a well-respected child psychiatrist. I was told that no matter how much a child under the age of three is abused, it won't affect him because he won't remember. Wow. Um, I have to say I'm aghast hearing that. Um, do we have specific proof about memory for any of us, even good memory? No, we don't have any specific proof. But again, as a child psychiatrist, and what I have observed clinically, working even with really young kids, is how how devastated they are at an emotional level when they have been exposed to any kinds of significant trauma. There's something called non-declarative memory, and um, non-declarative memory is the memory we don't have words for. But at an, a deep, um, rudimentary, guttural level, we have memory. And I would put forth that it's those people who have been so traumatized, have been so emotionally damaged at a young age, who are at the most risk. I think part of what the concern is, is if perpetrators hear people say, doesn't necessarily hurt the kid, well, obviously, there'll be more perpetrators using that as an excuse. So. Things like that should never happen to anyone. Um, but I've heard some pretty horrific things that um, humans have done to each other, which, again, just really saddens my heart. But what, um, what I know to be true and what I've seen so consistently is when people can start owning those memories, and especially that emotional content around it, and they are finally able to um, start mastering their emotions around it, that I know that freedom is around the corner for them. And it, so I guess um, if, if there wasn't that freedom, I think it would be really overwhelming, and I don't think I could do the work that I do. But it's, it's that joy in knowing, okay, now, now they know what's going on. I love what she said. She's nothing like the counselor who tried to tell me to go find proof. She doesn't ask her clients for proof. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation recommends suing counselors like her. Who would sue a counselor who's actually doing their job correctly? Laura Pasley says her counselor convinced her of memories that weren't true. She sued her counselor and received a settlement. I read what you had posted on Bad Therapy. It was when you were 39? Yes. Okay, do you mind saying how old you are now? 60. 60, and I'm 58, so we're about the same age. Laura was 39 when she wrote, at my first counseling session, Steve, which is what she calls her counselor, asked if I'd ever been sexually abused. I told him I had when I was nine. The biggest trauma was that I couldn't tell anyone. I didn't feel comfortable. I was ashamed. So I told that to Steve right up front, but it didn't matter to him because I had always remembered. I had been sexually molested at a swimming pool. Yeah. I told, I told him that. Yeah. I said, I remember being abused. It was by a total stranger. And he just totally discounted that. He said, we have to go deeper. That's not it. That's not what's the problem. So, you know, when you were abused, when you were, you know, by the stranger, age nine, then did you tell your parents about it? Oh, uh -uh. no. And so, no, 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 I didn't tell anybody. So, who was the first person you told? Uh, my daughter's father. Uh huh. And, and then that would have been in about nineteen. 
81, I guess, and then oh. I didn't bring it again until counseling session, and that's the only other person. Oh, so he was the second person you ever told? Yeah. I had kind of compartmentalized it, and then one oh. night, I, we were in a hotel, and I was with my doctor, you know, my boyfriend at the time, my daughter's father, and it just came flushing back all of a sudden. And, you know, I, and, I, and I told him, let's be still. My counselor said that wasn't, that wasn't it. It wasn't, it wasn't deep enough. But, so that's a recovered memory if it was compartmentalized and you didn't remember it. Isn't well, that? I didn't, it didn't consciously come to mind. I hadn't, you know, I hadn't thought about it in years, but I could tell it, it actually changed some of my behavior. But uh, it did, you know, it just kind of flushed out of me that night. But during, like, when you were a teenager and you were, like, talking to a girlfriend about, you know, no, all your secrets, did. It, but did you remember it? Like, other people would tell their secrets or whatever, and you would remember it and just not tell, or did you just not remember it? Just didn't, didn't remember it, didn't recall it. You know, it wasn't on my forefront of my mind. Huh. You know, there again, I did, you know, when I went to counseling, I tried to tell him that that happened. And yeah, and but that's actually a recovered memory. Why did she sue if she knows her recovered memory is true? Well, there's two different recovered memories. Laura says the memories she recovered in counseling are false, but she has a memory she considers true. She doesn't refer to it as a recovered memory, but that's what it is. She told Dr. Loftus about it. Dr. Loftus was on the board of the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, and yet they arranged for Laura to appear on talk shows and say that all recovered memories are false. Does she know that you, that you were abused when you were nine and you Dr. forgot it for like- entire story. I stepped out the next month on to a media tour that was just unbelievable for about two and a half years. Wow. I, and I told at the False Memory Syndrome Foundation I would do all of that to get the word out. Pam Fried from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation is the one who told me about Laura. Then I went back to see her a second time and I thought, oh, I did all the things she said to do. I did all the research. So I went back like, okay, I've done this all now. And it felt like she had no more use for me. I think she did my first interview because she thought she could convince me my memories weren't true. And that didn't happen. So she was ready for me just to leave. It is relatively easy for us to absorb certain things that we've either read or that we've seen and to incorporate them into our own stories to make them our own. It's and it, yeah. it, it's possible. And if there is a lack of concrete evidence, at some point, pe many people, some people, would either have to say, well, maybe it didn't happen, or I'm going to have to live with the ambiguity of never knowing. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that maybe that's what you'll need to do, is to just have an ambiguity that you won't find a, a final 100% answer. Yeah, I, I have, I've, I, I believe I found my answer. You have, okay. Um, I, I, um, I hadn't when I'd come before, but then I, I talked to you and the questions you asked were not that different than questions I'd already asked myself. I transcribed all the hypnosis tapes. What did you find with those? There weren't leading questions. It sounds to me like you're quite convinced, and I don't know why you're continuing. You found your answer, you're sure. You know, I think why I did, I realized what it was, was that this whole journey had to do with my mother. Did your mother know? Yes. I was older than 10 because it was in our new house. 
My mother always dressed elegantly for bed, and she wore shoes that are called mules. They have a hard heel. My father was in my room. It was 9.30 or 10 o'clock at night, and we didn't hear her coming down the long hallway. But when she started down the linoleum steps, I had the maid's quarters, and there were three linoleum steps. First, she very slowly went down on the first step, and then very slowly the second step. Everything stopped, and then the third step. All she had to do was take six more steps to be at my bedroom door. I knew finally, finally, it would be over. And we heard her step again, only she was going back up the steps. And I knew she would never walk through that door. Did my mother know? 13 years, my mother knew. Can I ask you, I mean, cause you believe your daughter wasn't molested. Can you tell me what process you went to determine that that was not true? Oh my goodness. Ugh. One is so overwhelmed when an accusation like that comes and a very credible person that mm -hmm. I've always believed. So I withheld judgment and started to do research. And in honesty, the most, in our particular case, the most telling uh, issue was the fact that she refused to talk. She refused to meet. She refused to communicate, to discuss things as, as people do. That's a lie. She didn't refuse to talk. No, she, they talked for a long time. And then it got to the point where after Pamela sent the Jane Doe article to everyone at the University of Oregon, that's when Jennifer stopped talking to her mother. Dr. Jennifer Fried chose to quit communicating with her parents after her mother, Pam Fried, sent a defamatory article to Jennifer's colleagues. And the Jane Doe article was really about Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Fried, but it was framed as a fictional article, but it was very clearly about her and it had all this false information. She wrote so a couple of crazy things. I thought the craziest thing she wrote was when she said, oh, when my friend suggested that I think my daughter may be jealous of me. And that's why she accused her father of incest. That is <laughs> yeah. so illogical. It, it is. But what was really horrible is she sent it, Pam Fried sent this partially fabricated story, but with enough truth that you would believe the whole thing to everyone on Dr. Jennifer Fried's tenure board when she's about to be tenured. The result though was that Dr. Jennifer Fried is, in fact, a tenured professor at the University of Oregon. DARGO is an acronym. It stands for Deny, Attack, and Reverse Victim and Offender. Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim and Offender. DARVO describes a perpetrator strategy. And in DARVO, what happens is there is an aggressive denial followed with an attack on the credibility of the person making the claim. It might take the form of questioning their mental abilities or their motivations, saying you're a liar or you have, you're crazy. And then reverse victim and offender is when the person who's being held accountable assumes the victim role and says, I'm the victim here. And in our, more recently we've been researching this systematically in the laboratory and we have found that unfortunately DARVO seems to work and um, it's, you could say it's like a perpetrator strategy. And the ways we've so far found it works is it's associated with victim self-blame. So if people get DARVO'd, they're more likely to blame themselves. And it's also associated with third party judgments. So third parties who are exposed to DARVO responses versus non-DARVO responses are more likely to doubt the victim and assume the perpetrator must have some, some uh, basis for making the claims. The, the 
good news is preliminary research in our lab also suggests that education about DARVO helps uh, mitigate a bit, that people who learn about DARVO are less likely to, um, to stop believing the victim. After over 30 years, Dr. Jennifer Fried retired from the University of Oregon. She is now at Stanford. Dr. Jennifer Fried's sister has also disclosed child sexual abuse by their father. If a corroborated case is a sibling who's always remembered, I mean, how could I get corroboration if Marilyn has a What's sibling? What's your evidence that the sister always remembered? Do you have corroboration? I do. As soon as my memories came up, I was 24. One of the first things I did was to get on planes and go talk to my sisters. My eldest sister, Gwen, who lived in Kansas City, when she knew what I was going to say, she just turned ghost white and she said, I thought I was the only one. I never should have left you. It's my fault. That would be a corroborated case. If you say so, I'll take your word for it. I'm quite hesitant because um, in my working with children, I have had children who were abused um, in class, and to have an honest student who was, who under, who experienced what Marilyn claimed that she had experienced night after night, and to still be so successful in school is, is difficult, but maybe she did. I think any honor students are incest survivors? Yes, but not night after night. Do you think the only honor students who are incest survivors were only incest I'm not, survivors? I, I don't want to try to talk about this anymore since I wasn't there. And by and large, I don't know whether somebody experienced things or not. If I have read or have reason to believe that there's an alternative explanation, uh, then I tend to go in that direction. I wrote a book, Miss America by Day, 11 years after a newspaper reporter in Denver learned that my father had come into my room from the time I was five until I was 18. It was a secret so traumatic that I had blocked it from myself. That's very difficult for people to understand that you can repress 13 years of the nights of your life. But how could I remember? How could I get up and go to school every day and get A's and be in the choir and be on the ski team if I knew what I was going home to at night and there was no one to help me and there was no way to get out of there. I had to block it, which I did. Your daughter Jennifer has said publicly that about the new dancing in front of your husband, she and another little girl. And I think last time I was here, you were saying it was when she was about nine or so. Mm -hmm. Do you think your husband has sexual feelings toward her? No. Why? why? <sighs> He's somebody that I've lived with for ever so many years. I knew him growing up. Um, I never saw any indication. But even the new dancing, I mean. He, never, it's, he didn't ask to have that. That was something that they decided to do. He didn't want them to feel traumatized by coming down too hard on them. But just to say, you know, go into your room or, I mean, did you talk to her about it later when you knew that had happened? I didn't even know about it for quite a while. Oh, she, he didn't tell you for a while after that? Well, I was working. The False Memory Syndrome Foundation closed its doors in 2019. What's the importance of the mother's reaction? In our midlife, we need to go back and heal the past. And I was 48 when I went to talk to my mother, and I was just sobbing uncontrollably. And when she finally knew what I was saying, and my father had been dead for a year, she said, I don't believe you. It's in your fantasy. And I thought, if my mother won't believe me when I'm 48, I certainly knew as a child she would never 
have stood up, never. She won't even stand up for me now with my father dead. What chance would I have had as a child? I knew as a child, how do you know that? You just know it. You know that it's not, it's not safe. There's no one to tell. As we begin to talk more publicly about it, as we begin to discuss it more, it's one of the reasons I wrote Miss America by Day, is to educate so that people have a better understanding, so that someone won't say to a 35-year-old who's just beginning to have to go back and remember what happened to her, get over it. It happened, a, why are you bringing it up now? This happened 30 years ago. This is textbook. Almost all of us are between 35 and 50 when we have to go back and do the healing work. And once we understand that, once we know that that's normal, I didn't know that that was normal. I didn't know that anybody ever got through. I checked myself into a psychiatric ward. I just thought, does anyone ever get through this? I couldn't find any woman who did. And it's one of the reasons I stepped forward. It's one of the reasons I wrote a book is because yes, you can come through it. I needed my mother. I needed my mother at age 48 to say, I am so sorry to her death at age 88. She just did not choose that path. I went to my childhood home. It was brand new when we moved in. I was in first grade. My sister Ruth was in third. We thought it was huge. We played hide and seek here. We'd always been close. Ruth was the only one from my childhood I could trust. This was the last home she ever lived in. Ruth died of brain cancer at age 11. I was nine years old. Ruth Ramsey dies after illness. This is the first time I've seen this obituary. I was disinherited, but I should still get to see things like this. As is usual, the funeral home employee picked up Ruth's body at the hospital, but instead of taking it to the funeral home, he took it to our childhood church. Outside the church, before the sun came up, my parents made me watch as they cut Ruth's body with a knife. Later that day, I went to my sister's closed casket funeral. There was a ritual outside the church where they made me hold a knife, where they cut, it, cut her body. As a part of ritualistic abuse, a child may be told she is an abuser, not a victim. A child may be put in a coffin. Put in the coffin, Just relax, let it come. Yeah, was it like repulsed by her body? I patted it. I put my fingers on her hair. And what I remember is touching her hair because she was still my sister. So why did your parents do that to your sister's body? There's never a way for someone who's not evil to explain an evil person's mind. But what was similar that had happened before is, this is before I started kindergarten, my dad um, killed our dog. It is not unusual for an abuser to kill a child's pet. He made me and my sister watch while he killed our dog with a knife. And he said that if you tell about the abuse, the same thing will happen to you. Yes. So then my sister dies of an illness, but she dies. And afterwards, they cut her body with a knife. and. I think it was to threaten me because I know what I know happened after that was my dad started coming into my room a lot more often. Why did my parents do, the, do this to me? I'm supposed to have an answer. It's hard to believe someone would do that to anybody, you know, their child or anybody. I've, I've come to believe in my old age that some people just are evil. <laughs> just. Uh, 
I never believed that when I was younger, but I'm beginning to believe it. Born evil or because of how they were treated? I don't know. I have no idea. I just can't believe people are born evil. I just think there's such purity in children. I decided to go to the cemetery and to the place where it happened to my sister's body. I made biscuits for the crew with my mother's recipe. I wrote a story about my angel connection with her. A grumpy old lady dies and becomes a cute little eight-year-old angel. I used to think of my father as an infant. I started thinking of him as a little older, four or five. That's how old he was when he was raped by a female babysitter. You know, you can't talk to an infant, but you can to a five-year-old. I had some things to say to him. So I called the minister at my childhood church and asked if he would be on camera. I told him I was molested by a church leader in addition to my father. He wanted to know the tone of the conversation and said it'd be a tone just like I'm having with you right now. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I, it's just a part of my healing. Maybe you could tell me some Bible verses that come to mind and what Christ thought or what Christ thinks about child abuse. And I'd go back and forth, what Christ thought, what Christ thinks. I, I do consider myself a Christian, but my childhood church wouldn't consider me a Christian because I, I don't have the same beliefs I did then. It was, it was a very conservative church. I was afraid when I didn't hear from him that there'd be like attorneys waiting for us there saying, you can't come on church property, but I don't. I, th I don't know how much is my fear because I mean, I was abused by church leaders, and and so it's the church leaders to, who have the decision making on whether or not I, you know, can film in the church. Um, and but the church leaders who abuse me are are deceased. The minister refused to be in the documentary, but he did give his permission for us to film on church property. I entered the place where it happened to my sister's body. In this place, among the same trees, I was comforted. You know, I'm glad you were my parent, because I am really glad to be alive. I didn't used to be, I used to be jealous of Ruth because she died. I know you also had to see things like what you did to my sister's body. You, you saw things like that when you were a little boy. And one thing I think about making this film is people are gonna think you're a monster. And so I guess that's why I wanted to bring this and show that you're also this little boy. So I brought this to leave. to play oh, Ruth Oops. it has been 50 years 50 years since you died I thought I'd be sad doing this today but I'm not you know my life turned out good and um, I love you but I don't spend a lot of time missing you you could have had the kind of childhood you needed to give me a good childhood. I 
I know this won't keep it, but I want to leave it and I don't want it to get rained on right away. Everything went perfect today, but it always went right by the just to some work. I'm gonna take your picture home. Bye, Dad. Bye, Mom. Ruth, I'll come back to see you sometime. Oh. I don't know if my parents did it to worship Satan. I just know what they did to me. And it may have just been to make child pornography. I went to a counselor a long time ago, and I said, well, but you don't believe in Satan. How can you believe my memories of satanic ritual abuse? She said, I believe there are evil people who gather and, and do horrible things to children. And, you know, she didn't feel like she had to believe in Satan. And that, that's where I'm at now. People used to say, uh, people like Dr. Vendercock are able to implant complex memories of satanic ritual abuse in people's minds. And I go like, wow, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I'm powerful. still struggling with the notion that it, it can implant, implant a, a notion in my patient's mind that I'm safe, that I'm to be trusted, and I won't rape them. And that takes me about three years to get them to be there. Yes. You know? <laughs> so this implantation of false memories, it's, it's all nonsense. So do yeah. you think satanic ritual abuse happens to children? Sadly, it does. Sadly, it does. I know they had cameras. My dad had excellent camera equipment, especially considering that we didn't live in that nice of a house when I was real little. Yeah. He used a closet as a dark room. He had professional lights. It's just so cruel and horrible. I mean, that really would be considered ritualistic what they did to my sister's body. They made me take off my panties and put hers on, that were on her deceased body. I think people think that child pornography is not that, you know, people don't know what child porn really is. I mean, if you think of it like you have this child who's otherwise treated well and just asked to take their clothes off and you snap a picture, that's, there's a lot more. I mean, that is child pornography. Absolutely, that's child pornography. But it can get a lot more involved than that. A lot of my patients, even though everything in their rational mindset, yeah, this happened to me, at the core, at the core, believe I was an evil child for believing I was abused. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and to, to really come to terms with, I was this little vulnerable kid out there right. who people did this awful stuff to, which happens all the time in our society. Yeah. And I was one of them. It's a very hard thing to accept. It is. If you work with traumatized people, you deal with these complex issues of memory. Yes. That is our field. We do that all the time. It's our bread and butter. It is what you deal with, of people who suddenly retrieve a little bit and they say, no, I must be crazy to remember this because nobody wants to remember this. Nobody wants to think that somebody who they loved mm -hmm. did this to them. So people say, no, I'm crazy. This didn't happen to me. And more and more stuff comes to mind. I said, I remember that. I said, no, I'm crazy. It's wrong with me. Let me cut myself in order to forget. Right. You know, right. that's what happens all the time. Right. And so when you're a clinician who does this work, that's the work you do. And so you help people to feel safe enough to allow themselves to know what they know. Yes. And that's what clinical work is about. That's a good way yeah. to say it. Feel yeah. safe enough yeah. to allow them to know what yeah. they know. But yes. nobody wants to know. The, the issue with trauma is that nobody wants to know. Yeah. Because a victim doesn't want to know. That's right. And they don't want to know that their own father raped them. They don't want to know that the neighbor molested them. Particularly when you're a little kid, because a little kid is, by definition, egocentric, and no kid can say, oh, that's just a horrible person who's doing something bad to me, because the way that the child minds works is like, this is happening to me because I'm a horrible person. Mm -hmm. And so no, no kid can tolerate really yeah. putting in perspective what they know, and 
every child who gets attacked, molested, hit, feels like I am a bad person for this happening to me. And so it becomes a shameful secret from yourself. Yes. Anybody who knows anything about trauma knows that. I had a patient who knew that her father molested her as a kid. And then she needed a babysitter. And she was so eager to believe that her father loved her and that she had a false memory that she had her father babysit her kids and her father molested her kids. Even though she had told me that her father molested her kids. We are programmed to love our parents. See, that's a yeah. thing that this whole false memory stuff doesn't yeah. get. My kids love me. Not because I was the greatest dad in the world. They just love me because mm -hmm. I'm their dad. Yes. You know? Yes. Uh, we get this love undeservedly. We get it mm -hmm. because of that's how we're formed. Mm -hmm. And what I see in my traumatized patients, they love their parents. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that they did terrible things to them, they still want to love their parents. And so when people actually come to the conclusion, my parents aren't safe, and my parents are going to hurt my kids, that takes an enormous amount of courage mm -hmm. and persistence to overcome our natural tendency to go like, the world is a wonderful place and my parents really love me. Oh, yeah. And that struggle of really, oh, my patients are just really always struggling with it, of uh, I want to go home for Christmas. Mm -hmm. I want to be with the family. I want to be for Thanksgiving. I want to be normal. No, it didn't really happen. What happened during that interview was totally unexpected because he could tell that he could tell something I couldn't tell about why I was doing this project. He said to me, you know, why is it that you're going around talking to these people? And I said, well, oh, it's for my project. No, it's, but he's like, he could tell there was a deeper psychological thing and he was right. To my mind, I don't mean to be over-interpretive, but this notion of trying to find authority to validate your internal experience is like, oh yeah, we need to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Because by now, we need to believe in our own truth. Mm -hmm. It was after my interview with him that I thought, why have I been doing this? And that I thought, you know, no one knows that. I mean, I'm an authority on my life. And you know, that has changed my relationship with Jerry because before it would be so upsetting to me if he disagreed with me about something. And it would be upsetting because I didn't believe me enough. Yes, I can actually carry on a conversation with you and <laughs> say I disagree and you don't either start screaming or crying. <laughs> I think it was my not believing myself that kept me connected to my father. And I needed some connection. I needed some kind of connection. Oh. I am so glad to be done with the pretense of having you as a father. I just have such a good life without you. and. It's always been a life without you, but I just haven't admitted it, and now I am. When I first remembered my abuse, I questioned my memories because I didn't want them to be real. I re-examined my memories because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life believing something that was false. Am I crazy? No, I'm not. Are my memories true? Yes, I am certain of it. How have I changed? You're more confident. You're, uh, you don't get sad as much. Yeah. More healthy. People who have been traumatized live on average 10 years shorter than other people. They tend to have multiple illnesses. Why is that? Because the stress hormones that have to do with the trauma get stuck and your whole body stays in this defensive mode, fighting an unseen enemy, while your, your mind is fighting like crazy to say, no, you're crazy, this didn't happen to you, but your primitive part of your brain is not capable of these complex manipulations of your mind, and so your body feels in danger, 
and causes all these illnesses. So every piece of research on chronically traumatized people shows that they all have physical problems, they all have major problems with har hormones because the denial of what happens keeps that whole stress hormonal system running. And it's not until people can say, this is what happened to me. Oh my God, it is over. This it was real, it happened to me when I was that old. And you can say, but today I'm a grown up person and today I'm safe. And you really, in every fiber of your being, know the difference between that kid who was abused back then and who you are right now, yes. that these stress hormones come to rest yes. and you stop attacking your body. Yes. Yes. Trauma 101. My chronic pain was so bad that some days I just wished I wouldn't have a long life. I mean, really, you know, I never thought about suicide, yes. but I, it was hard for me to think of living to an old age. And now I want to live to be about 100 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so we, as a doctor, that's a bigger story than the false memory stuff. Yeah, I can see. And the fact that you became the owner of your body. Yes. And that you regained the sense of power and agency in your body, I go like, yeah. I'm just not as afraid. Did you notice me being afraid a lot early on? Yes. I think you were afraid of me. <laughs> <laughs> you, were, yeah. you weren't sure of me, but I, I think wasn't. you're becoming more sure of me. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Just because I'm still here seven years later. Love does heal. It does. You know, it really and does. if you can open your heart to a new person and say, oh, this is what it's like to be loved. Yes. And somebody who's cares about my safety. That's the so the miracle of life. And people can find their way out. It's an enormously expensive and arduous journey. It is. But I know many people like you who have made that journey yes. and come out on the other side. When I went and interviewed her, her story was so incredibly moving and all the other details of the story that I did not know that reached far back into her childhood was so overwhelming to me that I almost could not receive it. And I told her that. And I gave her so much credit because she had so much courage. And that woman is Mary Knight. This word means so much to me. When I was a kid, my abuser said, if you tell, horrible things will happen to you. I told, and I'm getting this awesome award in front of a room full of people.
Hi, Shantana. Shantana, hello. I'm, I'll just go ahead. I think you're the first person here, and I'm going to go ahead and just introduce myself. I'm Mary Knight, and I uh, am a survivor of extreme child abuse, including ritual abuse and also um, familial sex trafficking. I was trafficked by my parents. I'll also introduce myself by saying I really have a good life now, and um, I'm um, I'm just really ha happy in um, just in my everyday life. Um, not to say that there aren't times that um, that I'm triggered or that my life is affected by my childhood. Oh, uh, thank you all so much for coming. And um, I'm glad to answer any questions you have about me. Um, and I'm uh, all here. I'm hearing, seeing comments. Thanks for taking the time to spread awareness. Um, I loved your documentary. Thanks for sharing your story. Okay, thank you for all your comments. Do you have any questions for me? Some of you have seen the documentary. Do you have any questions that you want me to answer about it? I'll just keep talking. Uh, so I decided to make the documentary. Um, it's a bit of a long story, but I was um, planning to either make, uh, I was looking into making a personal documentary, and I was also looking into um, writing a memoir. And so I, um, I applied to, I was in documentary class. Um, I. I don't have a degree in film, but I've taken a few film classes. So I was taking a documentary class and I was told like, um, it's not enough. You, you can't really make a childhood. You can't really make a documentary about something that ha only something that happened in the past. You need something happening now. And um, maybe my advocacy work or something, but I, my idea of just making it all about my childhood um, would not follow the form of a, of an interesting documentary. So then I uh, also applied to a um, MFA program, Master of Fine Arts, um, and I was applying to it as a part-time program, but um, I wrote about something that happened in my childhood and they accepted me. I actually have a letter accepting me and then I got another letter saying, we can't accept that essay because Basically, it sounded like because I can't prove it, because I didn't have newspaper articles or I didn't have police records while well, my parents were never apprehended. And um, so it felt like they were saying, I don't believe you. And that's how I came up with the idea of making a documentary, Am I Crazy? My Journey to Determine If My Memories Are True. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, so how did you overcome and move on to a happy life in adulthood? That's such a good question. I, I, am, I am now writing my memoir, I'm writing essays, so uh, feel free to um, contact me and uh, the moderator could put my email address up and I can um, tell you, I, I have a long list of how I healed. It's a very long list and it's, you know, it takes a long time and a lot of effort to heal, but I, um, I, still do things like meditate. I do yoga a lot. I just cross my legs in a yoga sitting position. Um, I, I take antidepressants. Um, and I don't think, for me, I think that was needed. Um, I used to take a higher dose and now it's a low dose, but um, I still seem to need that. I get, get counseling. I got, counts, um, I got counseling. Um, and there you can see my, um, my email address Mary Knight happy at yahoo.com or you can go to my um, my website my website has a list of how I healed I have a longer list also um, but on my website it's it's a rather lengthy list of things I did to help to um, heal um, wow there's lots of you here I I'm so glad you know I felt so lonely as a survivor of ritualistic abuse because you know people don't talk about it and um 
and and I know what I mean. And then I talked to another survivor and things that happened to me that were so bizarre. And she's like, oh yeah, um, I know a number of people. Um, and I don't know, could you let me know? I, I don't want to say anything too triggering for anyone. Um, so, so I know a little bit about what level I should talk about. Um, let me know, just put in the chat it's okay or or be really careful or something like that oh here's someone say you are not alone we don't talk because we haven't been bullied for so long yes um oh and what should someone do or say to help someone that has suffered abuse that question i'll go i, I tell people i'm sorry that happened to you I've heard one survivor who didn't like people to say that, but every other survivor I've talked to really likes someone just to say, I'm really sorry that happened to you. And, and then, you know, say, I believe you and I'm willing to listen. So listening to another person, one of my best experiences with a minister was a minister who he wasn't very good at, um, his sermons were not that interesting and he ended up, being asked to leave eventually just because he didn't he wasn't a dynamic speaker. But when I came in and told him about my childhood, he listened to me for one hour and he said very little and he kept apologizing. I just know nothing about this. And and um but he he just listened. And it's so healing to have someone listen. Um I want to address someone said something about the doctor the doctor had me screaming <laughs> i could not believe what he was saying yeah in in this um extended version of my documentary am i crazy my journey to determine if my memories are true it is um i have footage of leaders from the false memory syndrome foundation who um say some really odd things and one of those things, because I, I read, um, one of the things that people say is, oh, you have false memories and you've just listened to your counselor and your counselor has brainwashed you, which really, that would be hard for a counselor to do. And what would the motivation be? But, but anyway, um, I know that's not true of me. But, and then they also talk about, oh, you read a book, you read Courage to Heal, and that's why you have these memories. So I um, took, a month, a month, actually it was six weeks, where all I read was things published by the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. And I thought, you know, if, if they say this is why I have the memories, then maybe I'll quit having the memories if I read all their publications and everything. So in it, it was something real disturbing was it seemed like some of the books were diminishing the seriousness of child abuse and even saying that if it happened when you were really young it wouldn't hurt you so i talked to a board member and i asked him that and it was amazing the things he said on camera um, and he came up later i thought i had come up with this example because it's such an extreme example but no he's the one who said it he said no matter what happens to a child under the age of three they won't remember it, and so it won't affect them and he gave the example of a two-year-old witnessing the murder of his parents, which is so ridiculous. That would be like, you could just go pick up a two-year-old and, and take care of him and they would never notice they were missing their parents. Anyone who's babysat for a two-year-old knows that's not true. Um, I mean, this is just common sense that any parent, any person would have. It also diminishes the, um, importance of the early year of parenting during the early years and um it, it was just astounding that he would say that um so i'm you know i'm glad i have that in my expanded version um and um and then this is the first time i've had the founder of the false memory syndrome foundation um have included the footage of her um i I didn't include it before because I had this editor that I later found out his sister had been abused by their father and he didn't believe his sister. 
And first he just identified himself as someone who had been abused by his um, family physician. He himself had been abused. And so anyway, he gave me bad advice. He said that I shouldn't have two mother and daughter. So he wanted me to not have Eleanor and her daughter. Eleanor is the one who said, child sexual abuse is much to do about nothing. And a family shouldn't, a family should stay together even if there was child sexual touch um, and that the child should stop sex abuse. I mean, just ridiculous things. So I kept her in, but now I have both of them in and I think it works well. Uh, was there something you filmed that you were not sure to include in your documentary? Oh, so many things. I have so much more footage. Um, I have some footage which um, I need to find a place to put, but it's of another person who is describes himself as middle of the road. And he um, neither believed nor did not believe. He asked these questions that kind of nonsensical but he asked you know how sure am i and i said well i'm as sure that my memories are true as i am that god exists and so then he asked me percentage-wise how much do i believe in god which is a i mean i don't know it's not i asked a few people after that it wasn't a real popular question but anyway but i would say you know i i totally believe in god um and that's just my personal i i want to say if some of you do not believe in God, that's fine. I'm not trying to get you to uh, have a certain belief system. I think that survivors are very spiritual people, but we find our own way to be spiritual. And I do not think it's necessary to believe in a higher power. Um, but anyway, then I had someone who had acted in my first movie. I have a a romantic comedy that has identical twin sisters in it. It's Sister Mary's Angel. It's on my website. And, um, but it has a backstory that they were abused as children by their father. And, um, but it, it's not, it's, it's, I tried to make it more, more comedy than drama, but it's a combination of comedy and drama. Anyway, so one of the actresses had started um, doing production work. She started, you know, filming and everything. So she was, I hired her to like hire the camera people and that sort of thing. I paid her some and she paid them out of that money. So she was with me and I took footage of her and I before we went to see, his name is Dr. Jonathan Schooler. And um, who lives in Santa Barbara and works as a professor in Santa Barbara, California, and, and this actress is in LA. So I interviewed her and told her, or it was not really an interview, it was me telling her about my abuse, and she believed me. And then we went to see that psychologist, uh, professor, Dr. Jonathan Schooler, and afterwards I talked to her about how much she believed me. And she was like, oh, I would say 50-50, and it was, you know, I say, oh, well, that didn't bother me at all. But you can tell that it did bother me. It definitely did bother me. And I have footage of that. So I, I haven't put that in. Um, and, yeah, I have other footage, too. Um, I have, I tried to keep the sad parts fairly short, like at my mother's grave, at my, um, uh, yeah, I tried to keep the sad parts pretty short. I'm working on another film, Mothers of Molestation, a film about child abuse, and it uh, should be out by the end of the year. Um, so, yeah, so other films. And then, I don't know if uh, some of you maybe haven't seen my film on real, uh, real women, real stories, um, that is uh, two minutes long, but it's, it's really very, um, intense and it's um it's it's called why my mother molested me why my mother molested me so it's um but it's just two minutes long but when you see it you'll see it seems like more 
Is there a part two? Um, well, um, Mothers of Molestation is kind of part true to in that the film that's up, I was able to come to terms with my father during that film, but I realized after it was over, I still had not come to terms with my mother. And so um, Mothers of Molestation includes that. Um, let's see. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of people who discredit survivors and sometimes it's, you know, they just, people don't want to believe it. I understand people not wanting to believe it. And then there's other people who just don't want to listen to it. Um, would you recommend a video about SRA that isn't exploitative? Um, I, I have no firsthand information about it run, it runs in the government. I have no firsthand information about that. Um, and so what I do when I tell about abuse, and this is my policies, I do not, um, I don't tell about things unless I have firsthand information. And there's plenty of things that I do have firsthand information about. So, um, but that's not one of them uh, about government officials. Um, and is there another video? I, I tried to make my video as easy to watch as possible. And I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sorry. I don't know other videos to recommend. Um, I do have children. They are grown. I'm proud of my adult sons. And that's all I say about them. I, I, I just don't, I feel like it's their um, right to tell their own stories. And so I, I don't say anything about them publicly except for what I've already said in my film, which one thing I have put in my film is one reason I have hypnosis, really the main reason I have had hypnosis, rather than just waiting for the memories to come, was that I didn't know how to keep my children safe. I knew that there was um, there were perpetrators in one side of the family, but I didn't I didn't know about the other side of the family, and because uh, my cousins who remember I have five relatives who have memories similar to mine, they were all on one side of the family, and I didn't know which relatives I could have my kids around. So I remembered as quickly as possible, and hypnosis was helpful to me. I'm not saying I recommend hypnosis, uh, but it, it was helpful to me. Uh, I just had six sessions and then the memories have come so quickly I, I haven't needed some i do have uh emdr sometimes and um i um it, and that's helpful i mean sometimes it's easier to remember something in a counselor's office okay can you explain what sra is and what do you think about people um what do you think about people who label SRA survivors as being mentally ill or crazy. Well, obviously, I wouldn't want to be labeled as crazy. And um, I do have relatives who say that what I remembered is not true and who call me crazy. I've been called crazy. Uh, and, but, but what has been interesting about going public is now, you know, I like have over a thousand comments on, you know, about my film on YouTube. And I went through them not long ago, and there to count which ones were negative, and it was less than ten out of a thousand. There were less than ten, almost. I mean, the people who don't believe some of the people who don't believe me just have something to hide themselves, and you know, some of the people who don't believe me are people that I would not trust around a child. No way would I trust around a child. Um, and also, I mean, even if they're. Um, Someone I knew from childhood, I would, wanted to go talk to him because I thought maybe he would remember some things because I remembered seeing him abused. And he got, he's a minister and he got his denomination to tell me I was disallowed from going to his church. I actually have a paper saying, a letter saying I, I'm not allowed to go to the church. Um, I will ex give my explanation, uh, my definition of, ritual abuse, and I don't normally say satanic myself because 
That would imply I knew what was going in. I knew what was going on in the mind of my perpetrators, and I don't. I don't know if they were worshiping Satan. I don't know if they were trying to make child pornography. I know they made child pornography. So, um, but I don't know what their motive was. I mean, what's the motive for doing these really weird things to a child and then, and then um, taking footage of it? Um, so it could be child pornography. It could, it, it, it could be. I, I do think that child pornography sells for more if it includes religious symbols. I, I talk to churches and, and, and synagogues uh, and say, um, I think you need to be really careful who has a key to the building because um, these symbols, Jewish, Christian, whatever, um, the cross, the, the pulpit, um, you know, if someone can get in there and make child pornography, it will sell for more money. You need to be careful who has a key. Um, and, and I was abused in Sunday school classrooms. Um, I was abused on church property, um, outside on church property, like in the middle of the night. Okay. Um, okay, so I, this is in response to someone who talks about being half Czech and that things happened in Europe. I showed my film in um, I showed my film in Leipzig, Germany. I was I was um, invited, and uh, so I um, I was really nervous about talking about ritual abuse in in Germany. I mean, I was just nervous going to uh, since this. East Germany, um, not as many people know English. There was going to be a translator. I mean, there were lots of reasons to be nervous. But um, I wondered what they say about the ritualistic abuse. And it ended up a large portion of the audience, I would say at least 25% of the audience were survivors of ritualistic abuse. And some of them thought it was more prevalent under communist rule. Other people didn't think it was more common. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, some of the people were old enough like me that um, it was when uh, the communists ruled um, uh, East Germany. Do they know about what happens? Um, I'm not sure specifically that question if you want to tell me more. Uh, the people who call me crazy at, oh, I will say I have relatives who call me crazy. None of them have, like, this, this life stream is longer than they have ever talked to me. They have not been willing to talk to me for more than 10 minutes. Um, maybe one of them talked for 20 minutes. That is it. Oh, do my children know what happened? Um, again, and I'm, I'm really sorry because this is the one thing I won't talk about, but I just won't talk about anything about my children except for that they're wonderful adults. Um, and um, and they are doing well, and um, and that they do want their privacy respected. Um, oh, Netflix should do a documentary on me. Oh yeah, well we'll see. <laughs> um, one thing I like um, about making my own documentary is that I I have it. Um, I I have control over it, and. You know, I edited it myself. I really didn't want to edit it myself because it's a lot of work to edit. But editors have a lot of power. And I just, I like being my own editor. I like being able to decide what goes in and what doesn't. Um, someone said, apologies. No apology for asking about my sons. That's, that's fine. Um, oh, someone, thank you for speaking on this. Um, yeah, I, I can understand why someone would want to know how I've talked to my children. I just can't share that. Um, and um, I'm just reading some of the comments. Oh, I was trying to describe what I consider ritualistic abuse and how I because I needed to define it in my film and I define it as multiple 
multiple perpetrators and or multiple child victims, which is a very general way to describe it. Um, and then I say that often it involves sacred symbols. Um, but some people um, focus more on how organized it is, but it does have to be organized to have multiple, to have multiple perpetrators or multiple child victims. Um, under that definition, some people who would not otherwise call themselves satanic ritual abuse survivors do, you know, because I know someone whose um, father abused her and her siblings at the same time, and that would meet multiple child victims, but it wasn't any more organized than that that she knows of. Um, and uh, I also talked to someone, um, someone who saw my film actually on this uh, on YouTube on this YouTube channel she saw it and since then we have been talking on the phone and um, we talked about she doesn't consider herself a ritual abuse survivor but she definitely considers herself a torture survivor and I mean I think there's different I don't like it when the different terms set people apart I think it's important to um, be able to be sensitive to other survivors, even if they haven't, even if they don't use the same label. I will say it's been much easier on me when I describe myself as a familial, familial sex trafficking survivor because everyone knows sex trafficking happens, and it's hard to dispute the fact that parents or family members are often the ones who make the child available, which means that it's familial sex trafficking. Oh, yeah, someone's gone to watch the two-minute video. Yeah, glad if someone wants to do that. It is just two minutes long, and then I'll be glad to talk about that. Someone does not remember her dreams, which um, what I started doing when, because um, I didn't remember on my own, my um, aunt told my parents that she was abused as a child and that it, that it was generational. And my parents just said, well, she's crazy. We won't talk to her anymore. But I went and talked to her. And so then I really, she told me I had witnessed abuse and I just knew it was true. And I went to a counselor and she told me, write down anything, just get some spiral, spiral notebooks and write down anything. Um, it doesn't, it, no matter how mundane, you know, like we had a swing set in our yard or something, just anything you remember about your childhood. And that's when I started remembering about my um, abuse. Um, my, my first memory was, was not in a counselor's office, but um, I, um, I also started remembering my dreams and it was, kind of fun you know it helped me to trust my subconscious because sometimes I I predicted the future which is sounds more daunting than it was but I um I was homeroom mom when my um well with both my sons and one of them was in I think he was in fourth grade and so I um I my dream was that I that there wouldn't be enough um that the pizza would be late and that I would forget the forks, which you could say, when we, I mean, I forgot the forks because I dreamed it, not the other way around, but there was no way to know the pizza would be late. There was just one pizza place in town and um, like three of the five employees had called in sick. And so everyone's pizza was like ours. I mean, all, a lot of people ordered pizza that day. So it was just like, you know, it, it kind of reminded me that, yeah, we do have subconscious thoughts that are very important and should not be minimized. Oh, here, lots of love from Poland. Oh, email me and I actually, well, it's my first documentary, but um, someone from Poland volunteered to put in Polish subtitles and that hasn't been used very much. So email me and I will send you that and then you can, you know, show it to whoever you want. Um, so yeah, I have, I have it in, I have the first one, not the expanded version, not yet anyway, but I have it in Spanish, German, Polish, and English closed caption. 
Okay. Um... Oh, DID, dissociative amnesia, basically is where you compartmentalize the really traumatic events to allow you to function. Yes, I agree with that. And um, I have not been diagnosed DID, but um, some counselors would probably diagnose me in that way. Um, and I certainly have a lot of friends who are DID, and I enjoy um, communicating with their younger parts. I enjoy play a lot. Um, I know I dissociate more than most people, uh, more than people who have not been traumatized. And um, and that's a controversial diagnosis. I do have some footage of Dr. Bessel van der Kolk saying, in no uncertain certain terms, DID exists. And that's something I, I haven't gotten out there. Um, but um, it just take a little editing to put that together. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, that's another way to discount survivors because survivors of ritualistic abuse, at least 50% of us are DID. So then if you say DID doesn't exist and we're not going to do therapy for people with DID, it makes it, you know, impossible to, um, to get well. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, questioning my memories was, yes, I agree, it's very inappropriate. And and what Dr. Elizabeth Loftus did was, I mean, for her to say, well, how, I don't know if it really happened because I haven't talked to your relatives with similar memories. But she asked me how I know it happened, and that's how I know it happened. She didn't have to talk to them for me to know. Um, Yeah, she still wrote me the wrong way. Yes, that's probably about Eleanor or Dr. Loftus or both. There are many male survivors. I uh, There are. There are so many male survivors. I do I know a survivor who's um, I think would be willing to be in contact with people. He gets help from a couple of different male survivor organizations and um, he is a ritual abuse survivor. So if you contact me, I can ask him if he's willing to um, be in contact. Um, and uh, yeah, I, there's two different survivor, survivor organizations for men that I think are especially good. You are not alone. Yes, and none of us are alone. I think there's a lot of survivors among us today. Um, oh, yeah, I already talked some about Dr. Vanderkoek and the babies under two years old. I don't know if all of you were on when I did, but that's just bizarre for someone to think that abuse of a young child doesn't affect them. I used to do adoption work. I'm, I'm a clinical, I'm, I'm going back to social work. So I guess I could say I'm a clinical social worker and um, I'm um, going to do play therapy with children, but I used to do adoption work, placed over a hundred kids. And it's very obvious if a child's been traumatized, you know, they um, a one or two year old or a six month old. I mean, they don't, they just don't act the same as they don't interact the same. They're so different than a child who has not been abused. Why were a target for SRA? Um, there's more to that question. Why were you a target? Why was I a target? Um, well, I think anyone who goes public about um, satanic ritual abuse is just, it's unfortunate. And I'm going public because I feel comfortable doing so now, but it's, it, we're so discounted. And um, I don't feel like a target. I just feel like one of the people who has gone public. Um, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I, have, I have talked to someone who was from Chile and has firsthand information of the abuse and adoption, the, um, the really kidnapping of children and putting them in 
adoptive homes according to someone's political beliefs. It's just bizarre. My 10th generation direct ancestor was named Loftus, and I think my family has connections with the Oregon City Followers of Christ cult. Yeah, um, uh, but Loftus isn't, like I know an actor whose last name is Loftus, and he's a nice guy. So um, that doesn't always mean something else. Um, my maiden name was Ramsey, and my um, after my mother died, my father dated a woman who worked for John Bonet's father. So you now I've kind of wondered, but I, I haven't found any, you know, biological connection. But um, I do, my personal belief is John Bonet experienced some of the same kinds of abuse I experienced. Um, Oh, yeah. Someone said, I don't have multiple personalities, even though I have dissociative amnesia. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I would say I have disassociative amnesia because otherwise I would have remembered before I was 37. So, yeah, that's how I would consider myself, too. And then I have friends who are. Um, uh, we, it used to be called multiple personalities. And I, I remembered in 1993, I'd go to conferences in the late nineties and I'd have friends who would uh, be in younger personalities and I would enjoy playing with them. Um, we, you know, play with dolls and paper dolls. And I brought toys each time and I had this little, they let me have this little room where we could um, at the comp at the hotel where we could just play, you know, the night before. And I think it helped me um, be, uh, I mean, I just liked it. And other people did too. Um, okay. You said earlier survivors are spiritual. I agree, but how did you recover spiritual trust? That's a good question. Um, oh, and so um, I. I think for me, it wasn't as hard to, um, it wasn't as hard to um, recover spiritually because I, I had some, um, some communication with God, some like direct communication with God from the, well, when I was six, I don't know if it was a near death experience because I was very abused. It could have been, and I don't know if it was, um, but anyway, it seemed like God just, when no one, when I felt so unloved and just wanted to die um, and had been very injured, um, it felt like, uh, it felt like God was just, you know, shining on me, just, just, um, so when I recovered my memories, I also recovered that one. And I think that made it easier. Um, there are times I've had to leave church. I, I know that part of my abuse included candles, and I think it was a way to desecrate uh, or make it hard for me to go to church. I grew up in the Church of Christ, which is very conservative and doesn't, um, you know, wouldn't have candles. It just would not happen. I'm talking to Long Soul System. Oh, that's a neat name. Um, but... Um, I remember going to a Methodist church because I'd left the Church of Christ, went to a more liberal church, and they had candles. And it's like, they desecrated that. They tried to desecrate that for me. But I still, um, but they tried to desecrate communion too, and I still love communion. So, um, so yeah, they, they didn't do it. But the healing from that is really difficult. And that's one thing I've written a, an essay, which if any of you want, if any of you go to church or synagogue, or, um, well, yeah, any um, religious organization, I'd love for you to see it because I have ideas on how to, um, on safety policies that are not being used. It goes beyond the usual do a background check and it goes beyond the usual um, uh, have two, two adults in the room with the child or something. There's more we can do. And um, and I make the point that it's so hard to, you know, you, you need a safe place. And 
um, my safe place was school. Um, nothing bad happened to me at school, but, um, you know, we want our, any reasonable person wants children to be safe at their, um, place of worship. Um, okay. Oh, li little mayo. I don't know if I'm saying names right. Mold, moldy crouton. That's a cool name. Um, I thank you for your comment. Um, thank all of you. I mean, I, I. Uh, these are such good comments. Okay, I'm looking to see some new comments. Be proud to be a survivor. I love that comment, okay, from Chris, Kristen. Um, yeah, I was not safe at school. I didn't know others. It's so bad when um, that's um, Christina. That's so sad. Jane, oh, thank you for the nice comment. Um, oh, uh, oh, Christina, yeah, that's sad. Something happened to you at church. Um, yeah, uh, satanic ritual, SRA is satanic, it stands for satanic ritual abuse. Oh, yeah, so. Someone has asked again, satanic ritual abuse. And um, I used to believe in Satan, and I don't. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't, but I just don't. And when I used to believe in Satan, I had a counselor who didn't believe in Satan. I said, well, how can you believe me with my satanic ritual abuse memories? And she said, well, she believed that there were people who organized themselves um, in order to do evil things, evil things to children. And so she didn't feel like she had to believe in Satan. And, and I, I don't uh, believe in Satan now, but um, I do know that children are very abused. Um, so I usually say ritualistic abuse, although I'm fine with uh, someone calling me a survivor of satanic ritual abuse. I feel God kept me alive. Christina, yes, I, that, that's how I feel too. How did you get involved with people that were performing SRA on you from Bethany? Um, well, they were my parents. They were my grandparents. They were um, really all, all my relatives. I, um, I, I was just really basically born into it. Um, so it, it was generational. And some people say, you know, they really want the bloodline and I, um, I, I I don't have first-hand information except for I will say the abuse went back my aunt thinks it went back to her great-grandparents which would be my great-great-grandparents so she thinks it went back that far Thanks for your comment, Anne. Yes, I, I made this film so it would help others. I mean, that was my whole motivation. Oh, how did I feel talking to Goldstein, Loftus, and Dr. Pancras? I hated it. <laughs> I, mean, I really did not like it. I look at that footage and I'm like, wow, I can't believe I did that. I was, um, it was really difficult. It was difficult and if there's other survivors who want to make a film, I encourage you to have a support person on set. I just kept trying. I kept thinking, well, surely the person who's taking the cinematography or surely someone there. I've had, I really only had one real support person on set. Last time I was on set, because I, you know, I'm the producer too. And so I had to negotiate with the camera people because, you know, it's a, uh, 
but they don't cost a lot of money. And yet I had to pay people less than their usual fees in order to even be able to afford it. So they were fussing about when everyone was going to take lunch. And no one asked me, Mary, have you gotten to have lunch? And I mean, I'm talking about these really difficult things. So I would say, um, I, I would say that, um, it was horrible. It was, it was so hard. When I interviewed Dr. Loftus, I went, she is in Southern California, Irvine, California. And I flew my, um, my most expensive and really, uh, the camera person I used used to, he, he was director of photography the first year of Curb Your Enthusiasm. I mean, he's good. And he flew out there with me. I had negotiated a fee with him. And we made it just a real long day trip so we wouldn't have the hotel expense. He's a happily married man, and he's, um, uh, and I'm very happily married myself. But um, he's a father. He's a good father, a good husband, good person. But he didn't totally believe me. He thought Loftus had some good points. I'm like, what? And then I told him, I talked to him recently. I said, did I misunderstand or did, did you, what did you think of Loftus? And she said, well, she kind of had an agenda, but she had some good points. I said, people who watch my film, you know, they, they hate Loftus. And he said, oh, well, that's probably because of how you edited it. I said, no, it's not because of how I edited it. It's because of what she said. She said horrible things. And he, and he just didn't pick up on it. And this was my, you know, person I, um, and it was a day trip, but it was, and on the way home, when we got on the plane on the way home, I said, uh, let's just sit separately. I, I mean, it wasn't mad at him exactly, but it was just like, he was not supported at all. He was like the opposite. And um, and it was a hard shoot too, because I'd hired someone off Craigslist there who had lied to me about all his credentials. And so sorry, I hired him and started to ask for him. Oh, he had to have cash, which he'd never said that before. So I had to give him cash before he'd give me the footage. So we'd had this, you know, so... Bradley, the cinematographer I liked, you know, he, he was nice to me and everything, but, um, and helped me figure out how to get a lift back because this other person was supposed to drive this back to the airport. And, you know, he was really nice, a nice person, good person, but he just didn't get it. And I kept having people like him on set who were just like, yeah, not either. Um, Okay, so yes, it was hard. It was really hard. I would not want to do that again. Um, it, uh, the other thing that was hard was Loftus only had two hours, and I never knew when she was going to say, this is it, I won't talk to you anymore. And so I, had to, I asked her some questions at one point. She said, this seems very argumentative. And I didn't even, I did not include that in, um, there's more that I could have included about Loftus. She, um, uh, she, um, uh, there were ethic, ethics complaints against her. I, I won't go into more, but um, uh, I do have a friend who just is finishing a book on the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, and it has more details about that. So email me if, and let me know if you want on the list for that. It will be coming out very soon. Um, yeah, I, when I'm editing footage, I'm like, I'm glad I don't have to do any more of that, and I, I'm not going to sit across from people like that anymore. Um, and yeah, um, Dr. Vanderkoek was, you know, I love what he said, but he didn't have much time. He, I think that was a 45 minute interview and I just had to get a lot done in a short amount of time. And so that was, um, you know, that was hard in a different way, but I'm just so thankful he let me use the footage and oh, I'm so thankful. Okay. NAMI and family courts. Oh, yeah, I hadn't heard, I'd never heard anything about NAMI before. I did show my film at the NAMI chapter here, and I had a good experience doing so. Um, oh, thank you. Someone, uh, Sarah, you still did a great job talking to people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, All the evil help us improve our strength and inner light. So difficult process, but possible. Thank you to be here with us. Thank you. Um, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Piera. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced it, but thank you for the comment. 
Allison. Um, the family court employed these mental health experts too. Yes, absolutely. I know someone who almost lost custody. Well, I used to do um, custody evaluations. I used to do parenting time evaluations, or they're called they're called different things in different states. Some um, it's the kind of work a uh, guardian ad litem does, DAL. And I had a ritual abuse client, and I had not gone public about ritual abuse because I was afraid it, it would, um, the opposing attorney would discount me in court and effectively discount me in court. So I didn't let anyone in my professional community, um, uh, my practice didn't, not in the town where I lived, in uh, another town over, and I didn't let anyone know about my history. Um, and so then, um, I had this client and it looked like she might lose custody and she was such a good mom. I talked to the kindergarten teacher and she's like, her child is the best adjusted child in my class. And so I, I tried to find her. I, she'd been to counselors who believed her and I tried to find them and they were, you know, they were hesitant to say anything because, um, Again, you might want to, if you want more detail, you can read that book on False Memory Syndrome Foundation. But there was a court case in the late 90s where uh, a counselor was sued in criminal court. Um, like she could have been put in prison because she had done treatment um, with someone with DID. And then that person later said, I didn't have DID. And you, you talk me into these memories and they're not true. These were 12 abuse memories. So um, that was at that time. But anyway, I was glad I had gotten the case because she might have lost custody. Um, and I did let the father have unsupervised visitation. Um, and I, I don't think he's an abuser. But um, unfortunately, the grandmother, who was a ritual abuser, I believe she was, she had gone to court already and gotten one week in the month overnight, which is really scary. Um, so. Um, there was anything I could do about it. I mean, my main concern was that the father would give access to the grandmother and the grandmother already had access. So it, it um, so anyway, they are, I ended up being in court for that and um, even testifying. And, and she did, she, she got custody and her ex-husband got um, like, I don't know, two weekends a month or something. Um, if Satan, I, Tina, I just want to say if Satan is not real and people are made in the image of God and therefore should have his attributes, where else would evil come from? And who is it Satan's worship? Um, yeah, those are really good questions. And um, my answer to them used to be different than it is now. Um, I remember that it was really helpful to me that um, my beliefs and I'm not saying that my beliefs are true. I'm just saying they're my beliefs. Um, I'm, I'm um, no longer conservative Christian. I'm, I no longer uh, believe the Bible is the one and only word of God. Um, and um, so I don't have those same beliefs. You will find though plenty, a lot of people in the SRA community who do believe in Satan and um, what I think is my parents chose to be mean. I mean, um, there are some people who, there are some people who, in my view, it's just my view, blame Satan, but they don't blame their parents. They don't blame the actual perpetrators. And they say their parents were, um, you know, in this altered state and they didn't know what they were doing. I think, I mean, anyone can, why you were abused, that, that is a very personal question. Each person has to answer that, that themselves. But what is most comfortable to me is just saying, you know, my parents were so evil that I can't understand what was in their mind. And um, I, um, it, they did, they chose to do what they did. They chose to do what they did to me. Um, did they love me? No, I don't believe they did. Um, am I lovable? Yes. Did they love me? No. Um, and were they capable of? No, I don't think they were. And I do know the abuse was generational. And if you saw that two minute film I made 
why my mother molested me. It tells about the generational abuse that she was, that I have firsthand knowledge that she was sexually abused by her father. So in other words, the abuse continued and she was an adult woman and had me, had children and was still um, um, having sex with her father. I don't know a better term to use, but so um, I think for me, it's helped to hold my parents very responsible. Other people make other decisions about that that work for them. Um, that's not really a commentary on S Satanism, though. Um, that's, I mean, that's a belief system. Like my husband is Jewish. His belief system is different than mine. Um, so I just, I really am very accepting of belief systems for as long as they cause people to be kind and not cruel. I'm very accepting of belief systems. And, and I have been involved with like Buddhist uh, retreats and other things. And that was a part of what got me away from uh, some of the beliefs that are uh, exclusively Christian beliefs. Um, I, I don't know, maybe there's other religious groups who believe in Satan. Uh, maybe I just don't know that much about it. Um, thank you for speaking about your experience. And oh, yes, I've already thank you for that comment, I think. Let me see new ones. I am lost and don't know what to believe. Oh, yeah, that's a really hard place to be, Erin. Um, just to not know what to believe. It's a really hard place to be. And this is something I did, which is what it brought to mind. But when I first remembered my abuse, I would really doubt myself. And I, it was after I you know, had memories and hypnosis. It was, um, I, very detailed memories and I still, I would doubt myself and I started, it, it was so hard on me that I started giving myself a limit. I could only doubt myself two days a week and then I could function because I wanted to function as a mother, a wife and um, just, and a professional. I, I was doing social work at the time. So um, I think it was Tuesdays and Thursdays and I just didn't allow myself to think on the other days, maybe this isn't true. Um, and that helped me um, to have that function, to be able to do that. Um, as a survivor, what, um, Sophie maybe, what do you think about Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard trial? Do you think her loss is a setback for survivors like you? What is your take on it? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I hope this isn't too offensive to people, but when I was doing some really hard, you know, editing some of my really hard stuff and hearing and just having to like listen to my own hypnosis tapes, I mean, just really hard stuff for me. And there was something else going on too. I can't remember what it was, but I would, I would watch, oh, oh, it was, oh yeah, it was when the children were killed. It was the Texas shooting of the children. And I tried to stay away from the news and and I went to yoga class and online and the teacher the whole time talked about grief and these children. And I'm like, I had tried to stay away from the news. So I wouldn't much. So I left yoga class and and found out a little bit about the horrible situation with those children being killed, all murdered. And so then I found some Johnny Depp stuff and I just started watching it. And my take on Johnny Depp and Amber Heard is they have both been abusive to each other, and that neither of them are credible. And that it was like, it was like something I could watch that how much harm can be done that's not already I mean, if Johnny Depp wanted people to believe he's sober, then why not actually get sober um, and uh, follow what, um, what um, oh, the famous singer, he said, who had given him advice. Well, I know that singer did everything you're supposed to do in AA, which does not include drinking you now and then um, or drugging. So anyway, I... I I kind of, I'm sorry, I'm rambling and I hope I didn't step on toes because I know people have real strong opinions, but no, I don't think it's setback survivors like me. Um, I, I think 
that, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think it did. At first I did because that reminded me Amber's, Amber Heard's testimony and the questions reminded me of my first marriage, which was uh, verbally abusive. But later, when it seemed to me like she had lied, I mean, yeah, uh, that's just my opinion. Okay, we'll talk about something else. Other questions? Um, do you struggle with addiction as an adult, Chelsea? Uh, um, and yeah, well, I do. It's not the addiction you may be thinking of, but so many survivors are addicts and um, and I do recommend AA um, or NA, uh, Narcotics Anonymous, AA Alcoholics Anonymous. I think the 12-step groups are really helpful. The group that helps me is Al-Anon, which is for friends and families of alcoholics. And really, everyone, you know, in the United States, um, everyone all over the world, if you don't have a friend or a relative who is an alcoholic, I would just say that's very rare. Almost everyone knows someone who's an alcoholic. And so that means Al-Anon is available to everyone. And it's um, free. It's a great support group. And my addiction was to pleasing people. My addiction was to fixing other people's problems. And I still, um, uh, I, I went back to Al-Anon not long ago. And, um, and now sometimes other sport groups help me more, but um, that addiction to trying to help people. Um, I really want to help people. I mean, that's why I'm making the film. This is my life's work, but it's not my addiction. Um, and, but in, in personal relationships, sometimes I try to, you know, give advice to someone who hasn't asked for advice. And that is an addiction. It's a different kind of addiction. My uh, feelings uh, towards someone who's an alcoholic is that I have an addiction to, it's just a different one. Um, or um, sex addiction. I, I know someone who's a survivor of um, satanic ritual abuse and she's a sex addiction therapist. And um, I don't know if, I, I think she's full and I don't know that she does work online, but um, it, it is really hard to find counselors, especially over the pandemic, there's uh, such a need for counselors. That's why I'm going back and doing um, counseling with children now. Um, yes, Christina said a uh, um, uh, pediatrician drugged her. I was drugged. I, I'm sure I, I, there I, I have memories where I just black, goes to black, and I know I was drugged. I'm going to get myself a drink of water. I will be back in 10 seconds. Good, I had one on the table. I am happy to be here, Miriam. I am happy you are here. Okay, does someone who's already asked a question that I didn't answer yet, could you put it back in chat so I can answer it now? Um, and I will answer Aaron's question. Do I remember it? capes, rituals performed, incantations. Um, oh, what if you remember those? Okay. I, um, different, you know, I, I'm not saying there weren't capes or anything. My aunt thought that they had robes and, you know, I have memories that seem to be KKK, but I don't remember um, those things, um, but they, you know what, I, uh, the rituals are different, you know, and, and, um, I don't have one thing. I don't, I don't like Halloween's not upsetting to me. It kind of seems like my parents abused me in atypical ways. And that way I wouldn't identify as a SRA survivor. I mean, I've said so much that, this isn't about believing in Satan or not. I mean, when I believed in Satan, I, I still thought that they were, um, they were, they did a lot to hide their tracks. They did so much. They were very intelligent. Um, and also they had a medical doctor who's a friend who, and that's who I went to when I had bladder infections or when 
I had um, hard to explain bruises and scars. Um, so, oh yeah, I um, Aaron saying I don't have scars or particular signs. I don't have scars either. Or I have one scar here. It's like two stitches, and it's where that doctor I mentioned um, I had fallen. And I really, what I remember is I'd fallen roller skating. Finally, I was taken to him instead of to um, group health, which was um, through Boeing, which was free for my parents. I don't know. But anyway, um, well, maybe I do know because I, I believe I was drugged and, um, and, and molested by him. And my father was present. Um, Yeah, I, um, again, Aaron, my aunt does have flashbacks of people in caves. And I don't know why I don't. Uh, what I remember is, um, uh, what I remember is just, I, I remember a lot of nudity, frankly, uh, as far as how people were dressed. Uh, you know, that's just, thank you so much to the person who put something on screen about me being brave thank you and i i'm sorry i didn't catch the name but thank you so much this this feels so good i was nervous about this i've never done a chat like this before um yeah freemasons yes i have heard of cult abuse and freemasons oh robes instead of capes oh okay aaron you're from you're French. Cool. Oh, my parents were in false memory. So yeah, my, I got a letter from my mom that sounds like she was in the false memory center foundation. And, um, uh, um, Lynn Crook, who's in my film, she, uh, who's the one writing the book. She actually saw a TV show uh, that had, um, FMSF meeting in it. And she saw her parents in on screen. Oh, thank you. I just want to say you are amazing and so very brave. Thank you so much, KMB. Thank you. Yeah, abuse on trains. Yeah, my memories were great. Oh, oh, Aaron says not false memory, but Freemasonry. Oh, yes, I have heard. Yeah, I've heard um, of the Masons, um, although I don't have firsthand knowledge of it. Oh, thank, yes, thank you so much for speaking about SRA. Yes, thank you all for being here. I do think it's really important because, um, you know, we're, they've silenced us by being so negative about us. Do you encourage survivors to name names? I have uh, na named some names. My, although um, it's, I've talked to my entertainment attorney. The fact that my parents are dead allows me to like show their tombstones and stuff and um, to name them um, David L. Ramsey and Marianne Ramsey. Um, and then my um, mother's maiden name was Park. Um, but, um, I don't see, I don't have, uh, there aren't people who are real famous. I, when I talk about the doctor, I just say Dr. D instead of his, um, real name, but he's also deceased. And, um, why haven't these perpetrators been caught? Very good question. South facing, very good question. Um, I, uh, I tried to report. I tried to report to police. I tried to report to Child Protective Services. Um, and I just wouldn't be listened to. And really, it's laws need to be changed. So recovered memories are accepted as proof in court. Um, because, you know, otherwise people just need to, perpetrators just need to abuse children so much that the children can't remember. And um, that's a part of the problem. A statute of limitations are being lifted in some states, which is really helpful. Um, 
I, um, but in, I live in Washington state and, um, it's, you know, statute of limitations would help me because they're all recovered memories. And I don't have my relatives with similar memories. I have recovered memories too. So that doesn't help, um, in Washington state. And so, yeah, I'm in favor of laws being changed. Um, it's just so hard on a survivor to know their perpetrator is still out there. And most perpetrators do continue to abuse children. Um, I know my, my grandfather, I mean, he died when I was six and he raped me when I was five. Uh, I, last time I saw my grandfather, he raped me. Um, and, um, yeah. Okay. We have a question. Why is Loftus, um, I'll go back to that just for a minute, but I'm going to talk about Weinstein at Loftus working for Weinstein and other perpetrators. I'll just finish out what I was saying about why they're not, um, why the perpetrators are not caught. Part of it is it's organized. It's hard to catch people when it's organized crime and child pornography is always organized crime. And uh, part of it is not being believed. And Kenneth Lanning, who used to work for the FBI, wrote a report that um, that Pam Fry had asked me about because she said, oh, this report proves there's no such thing as satanic ritual abuse. And are you willing to read the report? I said, absolutely, I'll read the report. I read the report, and it looked to me like it was saying that the kind of abuse that happened to me really happens. Uh, Kenneth Lanning defined a satanic ritual abuse is people who are organized in order to worship Satan who commit pedophilia, but they do it to worship Satan and not because they're pedophiles. Well, that's an interesting definition. Um, and he also discounts it because some satanic ritual abuse survivors say that it's so widespread. And so that's why I will never comment on how widespread it is. And um, I'm just being pragmatic. You know, I tell what happened to me. And then the other thing is, um, but then he goes on to say there are, um, I've forgotten what he called them, but like organized child pornography, organized um, groups that abuse children and trade children between them. And, and he really describes satanic ritual abuse. And said it happens. So he never, he didn't discount it. He, it's, it's a matter of definitions. Okay, Weinstein, Loftus did, Dr. Loftus was not very famous when I interviewed her. She was kind of a has-been. And then um, the, um, she did do some behind-the-scenes things with uh, O.J. Simpson, Simpson trial, but she didn't testify. So then I heard about her again with Cosby. Uh, Cosby's defense team hired her. And um, she didn't testify, but they hired her. And she was willing to, I mean, she stated publicly, oh, none of these women, um, it's too long ago, and none of them remember correctly. And Cosby doesn't remember correctly. So Cosby should walk. It's like Cosby shouldn't be apprehended because all these women, there were a lot of women who um, were supposedly not remembering correctly. And, um, and yeah, it was just ridiculous. So then the next thing was she, she testified for Weinstein and she wasn't allowed to testify about traumatic memory because the court found her to not be an expert on traumatic memory, which good for them. She was limited in what she could say, but, um, you know, testifying for lot Weinstein, I mean, come on, you know? And, um, and that's one thing I've said something about the Johnny Depp trial, but I mean, Weinstein, I just don't see how any rational person could say that man's innocent. Um, and, and then um, other perpetrators, well, she's, yeah, she's hired by Glean Maxwell on, um, so she's, I guess, or she's already testified for Glean Maxwell. I think that's true. I know she was hired by them. Um, 
so yeah what do i think about that yeah i think it it's a commentary on who um loftus really is um you know you i'm really glad i have that footage of me asking her questions that she's never been asked before um and um yeah uh, she doesn't i have found out um that she has seen the documentary. This is indirect. Um, it's a journalist who interviewed her and um, she does not like my documentary. Um, so here is someone from India. Thank you for sharing your story. You are brave, love from India. Thank you for, thank you for being here. Thank you for saying that. I'm not gonna try to pronounce your name. I, I had speech therapy until I was in third grade and I'm not very good with pronouncing things. And so I'm a little embarrassed to try to pronounce things, but thank you so much. Um, oh, uh, Chelsea's watching the documentary now. Thank you, Chelsea. I'm glad you are. Um, and oh, Sherry, bless, yeah, bless you also. Um, yeah, Cosby joked about some very inappropriate things. Oh, there was one on screen that I just, bless you, you are courageous. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sherry. Okay, oh, good, uh, South Facing, I answered your question, that's good. Oh yeah, Hollywood connections. Um, yeah, that's you know one thing I think sometimes people say, well, satanic ritual abuse happens over here, but I kind of think I think it's all over. I mean, you just you have to keep your eyes open, and that's what I try to say to churches, and because um, there is a lot of um, this type of abuse um, that happens in churches. Um, and then I find like I was raised in the Church of Christ and I didn't trust people from the Church of Christ, but I've met someone who's now just really a friend who um, I have never met him, but he, uh, when his father, when his sister, uh, so Jim, his name's Jimmy Hinton, when Jimmy's sister reported child sexual abuse by their father, she recovered memories at age 19. He, um, he turned his father in, and uh, the detective was so good. She questioned his father, and uh, and she was able to question his father not because because not because of the recovered memory report, but the fact that his father still has contact with kids with uh, young children. He would his father would babysit for and let them stay overnight, and so the detective was so good, and the Jimmy's father admitted to 23 victims uh, during the interview. And Jimmy has spent, he spends his life helping churches be more safe. He's still, he's also a minister, a Church of Christ minister. So um, that's, um, it's just not limited to one church. You just, you know, have to be careful and trust your instincts wherever you are. Yeah, Erin saying she doesn't remember sacrifices. I I do remember sacrifices. I can't say they were actual human fetuses or actual I, because I couldn't identify uh, a fetus. I mean, I you know I at age four I couldn't identify a fetus from a distance. It could have been of a animal rather than a person. Where can we see the interview of Loftus talking about your documentary? Oh, email me and I'll find that. I can't remember. Philip is the reporter's name and he does have it posted on Facebook, so it's publicly. Um, and, you know, I think I will put it on my Facebook page as well. So I'm my Facebook, um, I don't know uh, if the moderator has my Facebook page, but if so, that's an easy place for me to post it. Um, and, um, or email me and I'll, I'll get that to you. I, I will, 
yeah, I was kind of nervous about posting it, but now that it's been posted somewhere else, I can post it. Do you and other survivors like Kathy O'Brien or Annika Lucas go to each other for support? I I don't say the names of the people I go to for support. Um, I will say I have um, seen Annika Lucas's website and it looks really good. Um, and she is about uh, her book. She's, she wrote a book that just came out. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, I, so her book uh, is um, is very recent, and um, her name is A N N E. That's not how you spell her first name. A if someone knows it, put it in chat, and then you can find her website. Oh, thank you, Amanda. <laughs> What a lovely lady you are. Thank you. Annika Lucas. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and so you can look that up and, and see her book. I haven't read it yet, but it's not didn't come out until this weekend. Um, MK Ultra is something I have no firsthand information about. And so I, I don't speak of it, but other people do. Um, I just feel like what I can do for the world is talk from firsthand experience. And then I um, I think that is the best way I can help other people because I'm speaking from what I know for a fact, uh, from firsthand fact. Oh, look at this. Um, and Mrs., but I'm not even gonna try to pronounce your name. Um, Mary, you are such a beautiful soul. You and your partner are precious. I wanted to ask, how did you find the power to forgive your parents? It was a cult member and still can't let go of the anger. Thank you for uh, coming on that. And um, yes, I um, my husband is in my documentary. He didn't really want to be in it, but he's um, shy and all. But uh, I mean, this he's not... Uh, his personality is very different than mine. And I, so I really appreciate him being in it. And yeah, he's a very good part of my life. Um, I do not think that you have to forgive. I, I know other people think that you do, but I don't think you have to forgive. Um, I, um, I don't know that, I mean, some people watch my film and say I forgave my father, but I think it's more that I came to a point of acceptance, but I never would have done that if I hadn't been angry for a long time. And I think sometimes people are uncomfortable with our anger and they want to shut us down. And um, it's really between you and maybe a trusted friend or a counselor, whether the anger is, is helpful or not helpful. Um, I just, I, you may, Let's see, Stacy, who is Eleanor's daughter. Eleanor is the one who says that much to do about nothing, tell abuse is no big deal. Um, she says uh, in my upcoming documentary, uh, Mother's Molestation, I have another interview of her. And also um, Eleanor's granddaughter is in that interview. So I interview uh, three generations. And um, Eleanor's granddaughter has never been abused. So the cycle can break. But Stacy is a survivor of abuse. And... Uh, she says, I, I'm, I have not forgiven my mother and I never plan to, um, you know, she never, apologized. she, she, so that's her stance. You don't need to forgive. Um, Lynn Crook, I think would also say, no, you don't need to forgive. Um, it helped for me to come to a point of acceptance so that now with my father, when I think of my father, I don't get angry. I don't get sad. I don't miss him. I just don't have much emotion toward him. I consider God my only father. And again, if people are new, I'm not saying that other people need to believe in God. That's just my belief. And uh, my belief is in a very um, kind and loving, compassionate God. And that's who I consider to be my um, father. Um, so I don't have much emotion toward my father. Did your dad's parents and your mom's parents practice SRA? Have you witnessed other kids being murdered? I have witnessed murder. Um, I have uh, I on my website, and um, the moderator could 
please put my, up my website again. I have um, an essay on that entitled, My Parents Were KKK Members and Pedophiles. And it tells about a murder um, of a child. And, um, and yeah, it, 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 it's uh, a hard article to read, the essay to read. Be careful with yourself when you read it. But it, it is up under the essays tab. I have two essays, and, and that's one. And, um, and it's going to be in my upcoming memoir um, that help will be out in the next six months or so, um, which my, my memoir is a collection of essays. Um, but anyway, I have each of them labeled according to trigger warnings, and that has the most extreme trigger warning. So be careful as you read it, if you do read it. Um, and I have witnessed um, uh, a child, um, I believe I witnessed a sibling being murdered, um, not a sibling that there was any birth records on. We lived out in the country, and I think they hid a pregnancy. Um, I tell about that in an essay that's going to be my memoir, um, in which is also extremely triggering. And it's um, I give examples of ritualistic abuse, and it's in that essay. And then I also give examples of um, familial sex trafficking, and um, I tell about my view of. Uh, my definitions of familial sex trafficking and the fact that I think many survivors of familial sex trafficking are um, rich, were uh, are survivors of also of ritual abuse. Um, I don't know the percentages, but it it's not a low percentage. Um, Pia says anger helps accepting. Help, anger helps. Accepting is my experience. Also, the brave women that speak out. Oh, cool. My parents, Christina, my parents had a complete double standard in how they treated my brother. Um, there may have been more to that question. Oh, did my dad's parents? Um, I don't know. It was it was on my father's side of the family that it was ritualistic um, and you know possibly satanic. Um, I mean, my my cousins who describe it as satanic ritual abuse. Um, and on my mom's side of the family, I don't know. Um, it was generational. It was, well, there were things that seemed ritualistic. Um, I was taken to the Veterans of Foreign War meeting. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a meeting or if it was, men that age, which my grandfather's age, most of them were in the war, were in um, World War II, would have been my grandfather. And so a lot of people were, a lot of the men were eligible to go to Veterans of Foreign War meetings. I don't know if it was an actual meeting, but I know what happened to me. And it was, um, it was um, me and other little girls being raped in being gang raped, but um, there are ways in which you could say it was ritualistic. Um, and that was, this is the grandfather who died when I was six. So um, yeah, I, he didn't go to church. So it was the other side of the family who went to church, but his parents were a Church of Christ members. So I, I don't know how much of it was connected with Church of Christ. I don't know how much connected with KKK. I. Um, he was, my mom's side of the family was very uh, open about being racist. My dad's side of the family wasn't. But, um, but I, that's this, I, yeah, I think there may have been KKK on both sides of the family, but I, I think my father's side of the family, there was KKK. Um, okay, go to something a little, um, Thank you for all the good comments. Oh, so yeah, the moderator is putting the contact information. But I'll just say out loud, my email is marynighthappy at yahoo.com. My last name has a K in it, K-N-I-G-H-T. 
my um so it's mary knight happy at yahoo.com spelled k-n-i-g-h-t and my website is mary knight productions.com um and yeah let's see are we oh what um karen what if you remember abuse capes rituals performed is incantations or in language of Greek or Latin, but no memories of torture or killing or blood. There's not always, um, I, I've known ritual abuse survivors who did not experience torture, killing, or blood. So I, I think um, uh, my def my own definition of ritual abuse is, um, is, would be, Multiple prayers and it doesn't nest. I don't. I think with my definition, it would be sexual abuse of um, multiple children, or with, uh, with uh, sexual abuse with multiple per adult perpetrators or multiple children. And so I, I, you know, it's it's what I don't think the term matters as much, but you need to connect with people who have similar experiences. And, um, and um, I'm finding, I'm in a private Facebook group for familial sex trafficking. and There's a lot of ritual abuse survivors in it. Um, I'm finding various ways um, to connect with people. And connecting with people is very important. Monique. Do you have any brain issues like executive functioning issues left over from repeated trauma? Does it show up in your life today managing tasks? You know, I, I don't, and I don't know why. I just, in ways, I feel like my recovery has been easier for other than other survivors, and I don't know why that is. I, um, well, you know, I would attribute that to God, but, but then that's then why do other people not have that same? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think that um, I think I came from a very intelligent family, and I think that helps me with with um, is one of the things that helps me mitigate the the trauma res the trauma responses. Um, but that you know, I know very intelligent people who have much more trouble than I do. Um, I. The problems, I will say, because I'm basically saying, no, I don't really see it with executive functioning. Um, but the problems I still have are sleep. <laughs> my my husband and I, I love my husband so much, but we slept in separate beds last night because I, I had an intense massage yesterday and I just was afraid I would, he doesn't like for me, he likes for me to decide, you know, he doesn't like for me he likes if we're going to start out sleeping in the same bed, stay sleeping in the same bed, and I just wasn't sure I could. Um, and that's something I really want to get over. Um, and um, although there are couples our age that sleep in separate beds because snoring gets worse as you get older, so I don't know that that's so atypical, but um, I have nightmares. <laughs> One time I bit my husband at night. <laughs> I was asleep, but but uh, I bit his arm. <laughs> so anyway, um, he's he's been very patient with me. Um, and so that's a that's a problem I still have. Also, I'm um, I'm I, that my addiction to pleasing people and to giving advice, unsolicited advice is, is still there and that's something I have to watch in my life. But the other thing I wanna say is I really do have a good life now. I never would have thought at age 40 that I would ever have the kind of life I have now. I just, I um, one of my problems was I was drawn to men who were, um, well, verbally abusive, I guess, um, and just um, selfish. And so now I have a husband who's who's really wonderful. And I knew when I I knew that he wasn't like the other men, and uh, that I had dated. And I knew I needed to really pay attention to, you know, if I was like, oh, he's not the right person because I don't like the shirts he wears or something. You know, I needed to not let myself 
um, disregard this relationship for some tiny reason. And um, and I'm, I'm really glad I did that. But I was aware, like, this is the t sort of person I need to be with. And um, so, yeah. Um, oh, um, Earth is a Giant Grave. Oh, interesting name. But I uh, searched random online broadcasting and ended up here. I'm glad you're here. And, oh, we love him for you. You mean my husband. I'll tell him. He gets such good comments and he keeps going, I don't see why you needed me in your film, but yes. What's SRA? And again, I'll say my definition. It's satanic ritual abuse. And um, again, I'll say my definition is that it involves multiple perpetrators and or multiple child victims. Yeah, I, I do have a wonderful husband who's accepting and loving. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I love people talking about my husband. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, he's he's great. Um, we just had a foster child uh, for two weeks. Well, we are, we're respite foster parents. And, um, and so um, this child, um, Respite means we just keep the children for a weekend to give their full-time foster parent a break. So this little boy uh, went back to his biological mom, which is, you know, what foster care, the, the goal of foster care is to reunite the family. And it worked for him to go back. And um, when he got back, he told the foster mom, I still want to do respite. And she had no idea what that meant. But when she found out about us and when she found out that um, her social worker would like for him to still come to us. Um, then she said, yeah, you know, so we kept him weekends. And then she moved out of state. Now we fly him in to see us once a year. So my husband, who spent two weeks with this 13-year-old, just like the, the, the young man, just um, some problems he has, some he's just not good at making friends. So he considers my husband his friend and they've just been off seeing tide pools and going on going, um, walking down to the lake and just doing all kinds of things during this time. But, um, I don't know if we want two weeks next, we did one week last year and this week, two weeks, that two weeks might be a little long. Um, but he leaves the little boy leaves on Saturday. Um, but yeah, my husband's been great. Someone asked satanic. Um, so I've talked about satanic, like I don't believe in Satan anymore. And I know some of you really believe in Satan and that, that that's a way to conceptualize how, why someone would do this. And it does seem, you know, when I did believe in Satan, I did attribute Satan to having um, powers. But now I think that each person can choose to be evil or can choose to be good. So, um, yeah, that's my comment on Satan. Um, but um, I have no problem with being identified as a satanic ritual abuse survivor, even though I no longer believe in Satan. And I very much disagree with, I mean, satanic ritual abuse happens. It, it happens, it continues to happen. Um, and I know young survivors of it. Some people say, well, it just happened a long time ago. That's not true. Um, I was at a conference. My husband at first was like, well, maybe it's not something that just happened a long time ago. And I was at a conference and I talked to a survivor who looked young and I said, you know, do you mind if I ask you how old you are? And she's 19. I mean, this, it just keeps happening. Um, oh, someone, Don adopted twin foster boys that's so cool um and yeah that's great um so many more um foster homes are needed is it easier to identify as sra than an incest survivor no i i think um i i think incest survivors are more readily believed and um i of course, I've always said that it was my parents, so I've never, um, you know, not disclosed that part. I, I think I have heard of people who disclose abuse by non-relatives and not by their parents. But for me, um, I, I couldn't 
I couldn't talk about satanic ritual abuse without talking about my parents being abusers because they, they are, they were there most of the time and they, my parents were and, um, or they very much gave me over to my grandparents or, um, or, or they trafficked me. I used to not know what, I didn't identify as a sex trafficking survivor until I finished my film and I was looking for a fiscal sponsor. And someone told me about Shared Hope International and that it was for um, human trafficking survivors. And I said, well, I don't think I am a human trafficking survivor. And they said, well, but you talked about child pornography and child pornography is by definition human trafficking. I mean, someone is, if, if it's sold, someone is, is making money off the, um, off the uh, victimization of children. So, um, so that's when I started identifying. I mean, it took that long, but a lot of familial sex trafficking survivors don't identify as such because they think it doesn't count because it, like I did, I thought it didn't count. I thought it didn't count because my parents did it, but I knew I'd been sold to people. So now I identify, um, it's easier to identify as familial sex trafficking because everyone knows it's, everyone knows that children are sex trafficked. Um, I don't know if I answered that. I, I tried to answer that question about, for me, it's, for me, sometimes it's different. You know, the, the incest is as hard to deal with as a ritual abuse. I mean, I remember my aunt asked me and my cousin, which was harder to deal with incest or, or um, satanic ritual abuse. And we both said, well, depends on which one you're dealing with at the time. If you're, we're dealing with some new memories of incest. That's the hardest. If you're dealing with some new memories of satanic ritual abuse, that's the hardest. It's um, they're both just as hard as it can be. And the other thing I want to say, because some survivors on this call are not SRA survivors, but you're incest survivors. And I just want to say, it's not how bizarre the abuse is, how much it affects you. Each person is different. It's like saying, I love chocolate ice cream more than you love chocolate ice cream. How can you know you can't compare those two? And so, um, because it's internal. And I think that's a way you can't compare how bad your abuse is to someone else's because it's how you affect have been affected internally. So I just want to say, like, one of my friends was – she's had to deal with chronic pain her whole life. And it's from a one-time incest by her brother, who was just like two or three years older than her. I mean, it was a one-time, and it wasn't, not only was it not torture, it was not physically um, painful um, and did not include intercourse. And I mean, from every definition, it was much more minor than mine, and yet she's still dealing with, um, I think she's dealing with more chronic pain than I am. And I used to deal with a lot of chronic pain. Okay, uh, new question. My mother introduced me into SRA and trafficked me later. People believe the trafficking, but don't want to talk about SRA. And I wonder why. Yeah, yeah, I think it's what the media has done to SRA or you know how, I mean, we are now in a time when people are wanting to help human trafficking survivors and um, yeah, I'm glad I've gone public about both, but I, I do know people who don't go public about SRA. One was a minister to me. It was so sad because she's a minister and she thought, she thought her, her church could, ex could handle hearing about the incest. So she told him that. And then she had just started telling him something about the, um, human trafficking, about the sex trafficking but she didn't think they could ever handle the SRA. And I just, oh, that's so sad because churches are supposed to accept and love and all that. Oh, someone wants, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, that's, I hope I've answered that. Um, if I haven't answered your question, feel free to post it again. Someone, um, Don has chronic pain. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, abuse and chronic pain. I mean, it's not always, not everyone who has chronic pain was abused, but so many, it's so prevalent. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, I, I don't, Christina made a comment and I, I don't know anything about that. So I don't have anything to add about 
uh, this nonprofit. Um, oh, I sent your, John says, I sent your video to my mother yesterday, and I pray she will watch it and it can open a conversation. Thank you for your help for us. Oh, thank you. And yeah, I, I, uh, we have 15 minutes left, by the way. Something just flashed across screen and I, I didn't get a chance to read it. Um, maybe it's up here. Uh, the Body Keeps the Score. Oh, yes. Um, the book, The Body Keeps the Score by um, Vander Koek. I highly recommend. It has been on the science bestseller list since it came out. And it came out in, I don't know, 2016. Um, and I, I think it's very worth buying or you should be able to get it at a library. It's a very popular book. Um, and yeah, again, I don't know about the person you mentioned, uh, Christina. Um, oh yeah, Christina also says that she was hospitalized to discredit, to be discredited. Yeah, I think so. Um, there are so many different ways they tried to discredit us, which is very sad. Well, we have uh, we have um, just a little over ten minutes. Any, uh, I like to end on something happy, and so unless there's some other questions, I'm going to talk about because I was asked how did I recover, and I'm going to talk about that. I, I think that's a good way to end. Um, so many different things I did. Oh. Have you had anyone speak of the problems with getting counseling when you are low income? Oh, it's so hard to get counseling. It's hard. I went to three different counselors once I moved. I live in Bellingham, Washington, and I went to three counselors here who could not handle my life experiences. And I mean, they were, it was bizarre the things I went through. Um, and finally, I called my, um, insurance because I was trying to go to someone with my Kaiser insurance and I called Kaiser and said I told him all my experiences and and said you have to let me go to someone else and they did and so um I went to a, a sex therapist for a while and um not not for sex therapy but just I knew with her credentials she um I thought that she would be able to handle what I had to say and I was right she was um but it's so hard to find a counselor, whether you're low income, whether you have insurance, it's just so hard to find a counselor. I wish I had some ideas on that. Um, I will say um, I can give some, uh, for low income people, um, some things that like, I think you can get coaching through Elevate. Elevate is a, a nonprofit uh, by Rebecca Binder um, and, um, she does a lot of, she does classes. She is a Christian herself, but um, her classes are open and, you know, people of all religions and non-religions are accepted by her. Um, and so that's something to look up. Um, I wish I knew more about how to help people who, who don't have insurance. I don't even know. It's even hard if you have insurance. Do you find that talking publicly about your experience is therapeutic? Um, yes. Um, and then can it sometimes be too much? Yes. My husband was you know, like, he's gotten used to like the day after I do something that it's, um, you know, that I might have a hard day. It's gotten less so. I'm feeling really good right now. So I'm feeling comfortable right now. I think I'll be fine later today. Um, but um, uh I, I think all of life is therapeutic. And I kind of like when people say, was your film therapeutic? And when counselors ask that, especially I say, you know, I want to say doing social work was extremely therapeutic. Um, you know, many things in life are therapeutic. And I think um, when I think, I think that's okay. I think, you know, helping other people is therapeutic. Um, but yeah, the thing that, this Am I Crazy film, I just don't ever question my memories anymore. I never question them. I know they're true. I mean, I sat across from people who asked me any question they wanted, and they didn't ask any questions I had 
no questions I hadn't already asked myself. So yeah, that was therapeutic and I came to terms with my father. I mean, it's really nice to be able to not think about my father very much. I just really don't think about him much. I was on a, I'm in a private Facebook group that uh, someone was like, is Father's Day hard for you? And I, I'd, I'd actually forgotten about Father's Day. Uh, you know, that was my first reminder that today, that Sunday was Father's Day. And, but also um, on Father's Day, I have a tradition to call each of my sons and tell them, you know, I'm happy Father's Day. I'm proud of you. And I just think you're really a good father. And so that's what I do on Father's Day. I, I, I don't think about my father. Um, I, I just, yeah, God's my father and God's a good father to me. Do you think that SRA affected your behavior? You seem so calm and peaceful. Um, yeah, I, I do seem calm. I haven't always seemed that way, but it's been, I'm 67 years old. So I'm, you know, I'm an old lady and um, I worked really hard to get to where I'm at now. And one thing I do, what I tell people, um, and I have this on my website with how I healed, is think of it as your part-time job. And that's how I had to do it because some days it seemed like all I did was things to help me heal. And, and, and then I'd feel like at night, I'd feel like, oh, I didn't get anything done today. And so I started thinking of this is my part-time job and eventually I'll be well. And uh, this was after my divorce and I didn't know how I would um, support myself. And I got um, spousal support for five years. And, um, but I just knew I need to work on getting well because I can never support myself unless I get more well. So, um, and I, I think whether you heal more in your body or heal more in your mind, I mean, like going on walks is really helpful for me. I'm going to go on a walk later today and it's, it's real beautiful, uh, beautiful trails just right out my door. I'm very fortunate. So, um, yeah, uh, healing, um, uh, yeah, I, you know what I hate is when I was first remembering my abuse and someone said, said I should read that, I think it's called The Hiding Place, but it's about uh, someone whose parents hid um, Jews from the Nazis. And they're like, and she forgave everyone. Well, if you actually read the book, you find out that there were many years that she didn't forgive. And then she has a quote at the she has a situation at the end of the book where she met someone who had tortured her sister. And at that point she was able to forgive, but that wasn't right after it was not right after. And so I just, I think everyone goes through their journey and, and um, don't expect too much of yourself. And one of the things I do to help me heal is I read novels, you know, I, I have fun and I quit watching as many um, hard films and I just let myself be, um, yoga is so helpful to me. I, I spend hours a week. Yes, that's right, Tina, it's the hiding place. But you know, you read that whole book and she did not, she eventually forgave, but she didn't initially forgive. And someone, I was taking singing lessons from someone um, which was helping me as a part of my healing. And um, his wife, it was an older couple and his wife said, well, couldn't you just do this like her? And I'm like, did she really do that? So I read the book and it wasn't true at all. I mean, I think the person who said that to me was trying to protect herself from my grief. And that's not a good way to do it. Um, and um, you just need to accept people where they are. Horses, yeah, horses. Um, P.S., yeah, they... They can be really therapeutic. Therapeutic art. Oh, yeah. I, I love art. Um, oh, uh, Christina, the gymnastics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I won't get into that because I'm trying on the healing stuff. But um, uh, I'm talking about healing. But, yes, that, that was horrible what happened to the gymnast. Well, we have less than five minutes. Yes, so I just think recovery is possible. You keep working at it and you will recover. And I just want that message to really come through to you because 
that helped me during the days when, I mean, I, my spousal support was going to run out. I didn't know how I would support myself. And I just, the, the focusing on the recovery helped. Um, and the hope of believing that I would recover. So that's what I want to do for you today is make you hopeful that you can recover, make you hopeful that your friends will recover and, um, and, and have a happy life because I truly do have a happy life now. I um, have children in my life just as much as I want to have children with the foster care. And also I volunteer at my, grand, at my grandson's school. And um, I, um, you know, there's just so much beauty and peace in my life. So as um, so much as you can. And today, after listening to this, you really need to be careful with yourself. And when I'm in a group of people that everyone can answer, I ask them, think of something you can do today to take care of yourself. Because being in on this Q&A was hard. And remind yourself of that and think of one if you could just take a minute right now think of one thing and put it in the chat if you want one thing you'll do today to take care of yourself so yeah if you can think of something that you'll do today to take care of yourself i just really encourage you to think of something you'll do today to take care of yourself i'm gonna read more of my novel um, and uh, I'm going to um, go on a walk, and um, uh, I'm, yeah, you know, I guess those are what come to mind. I'm going to fix myself a really, um, a lunch I really like. So those are three things. So I hope you can think of some things that, that um, will help you. And Wendy, I didn't get a chance to comment on yours, but feel free to email me if you like. Um, yeah, I'm. Um, oh, this is cute. Um, Earth is a giant grave. Lion's strength is known by their by their scars. Oh, thank you, Wendy, for your comment. Thank you, P.S. Thank you all of you for your wonderful comments. Um, we had talked, I talked to the moderator about what to do if we had uh, difficult comments, but um, we didn't have any. Thank you all. Thank you so much. I just so much appreciate it. Uh, I'll just say again, um, focus on recovery. You know it's hard work, but know it will pay off and have some fun today. Take care of yourself today. I've really, this has been a great meeting and we'll do this again, by the way, we're gonna do some more Q and A's. We have less than a minute. Oh, thank you. Uh, the thank yous and the hearts. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Take care of yourself today, really. I really mean that. I really want you to take care of yourself today. Find support. Yeah. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, the abuse is real. It is. It is. We're not crazy. The people who say we're crazy are, are the ones living in a different reality. We're, we're in, we're in truth. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you all. What wonderful comments. Yes, we plan to broadcast again. Well, bye. Thank you, Don. Yeah, thank you, Pam.